Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Just to make you aware, this podcast may contain some explicit slash offensive language. And if that's not your thing, you don't have to listen. But I have given you a warning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. You don't know the half of it, but yeah, um, I'm anyway. So I'm, hoping, I'm, on a, I'm skating on the thinnest <laughs> ice known to man. Like. He said, and um, they put a poison in the tank that just instantly kills them. He went, and we've run out of it, so we cut their heads off with shovels. Suddenly, bang! The whole boat exploded. Take your sort of eight-inch long piranha and imagine that at four, five, maybe six feet. I said, I've revived your dead fish. <laughs> F off, he said. You haven't. That was just humongous. It was... I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I'm just battling this fish out and I'm, I know it's a black moon. I'm, yeah. like, I'm saying I'll never be a naughty boy again. If you catch fish and you return them to the water, then you are my brother. Welcome to the Nash Off The Hook podcast special. It's the first one we've done outside in a swim and this venue is fitting to do it on. We're at Grenville in the cabin swim. And as if that wasn't mega enough, I'm joined by an epic guest. I've waited a long time to get the man on. It's none other than Paul Bacon. Paul, how are you, mate? Um, not not too bad, Hassan. How are you, mate? Mate, yeah. I am the best <laughs> I've ever been, mate. I'm a, I'm at Grenville, full of big fish. I'm with you. We're doing a podcast. Life can't get yeah, much better, that's mate. the first time you visited the lake as well, isn't it? <laughs> I've literally been here an hour and a half, seen some epic fish. I mean, a brilliant swim, and we get to pick your brains and go through some of the incredible things you've achieved during your carp fishing career that's still going, and some of the incredible feats you've had oh, on air. Oh, oh, and I'm away. I've got a bite already. I'm off. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, me and Paul are going to have to apologise. You might see that my sleeve's wet. I've had my first bite as just as we started, as I said it happened. Um, <laughs> an incredible fish, and I'm shaking like a little teenage girl. What a place, the old Grenville. Yeah, well, that's Grenville for you. You know, um, <laughs> the fish are out there. We've seen a few fish shows. We felt quite confident, didn't we? But, you know, I did say that there was a high chance we'd get a bite <laughs> during the recording. And, um, yeah, two minutes in, there it goes. <laughs> oh, did it go? So there's some clever heads that you haven't seen that, but I will overlay a little picture of uh, yeah, my first buy on Grenville, one that I will not forget, mate. We're definitely going to talk about this complex. You've done incredibly well on here, and it's an incredible venue, but we're also going to talk about you, your sort of thoughts around technical aspects like rigs, because that's really what, not probably as publicised as it should be, but you've got some fascinating insight into that, and then also your history as an angler. Recently, Paul, let's go back to sort of now. What what's the mainstay of your fishing, or what have you been up to? What what in in sort of like now? Yeah. Um, well, for the last, um, well, it was Paul, the owner, that 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 um, reminded me that I've been here. I'm just coming up to my sixth sixth season on Grenville, um, and yeah, you know, it's time time passes so fast there. I, I've I, I love fishing here. You know, it's um, when I first came to Grenville, I'd been I'd been fishing the Stone Acres and the Lynch Hills type waters where you were probably you know, you're targeting single big fish, you know, quite busy sort of circuit waters. And even though I've done that probably for most of my fishing career, you know, it was time that I wanted to sort of go to a syndicate that was a little bit quieter, you know, not as many anglers on the banks, you know, and, you know, I'm not ashamed to say that I wanted to not concentrate on the, you know, two, three, four, maybe half a dozen fish per season, which is good from Stone Acres and the likes of them sort of waters. I wanted to go somewhere where the possibility of multiple, multiple bites, multiple, you know, big hits. So, you know, during the course of, um, you know, the 80s and 90s, you know, you, I saw Grenville on all the magazines and at the time the fish were upper 20s and 30s. And, you know, I've kept, sort of like kept my eye on the lake and seen the fish were growing. And yeah, you know, put put my name on the waiting list. And then after a certain amount of time, Paul invited me down and managed to get a Grenville ticket. And you know, as you've seen, you know, the, the lake's spectacular. You know, it's it's, it's so so good. It's like carp fishing on steroids, mate. Yeah. I uh, I couldn't do that all the time. I will tell you that, mate. I'd be uh, I'd be a differing wreck. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna go back, mate. You're northwest, a bit like myself now. Although I'm an adopted sort of northerner. You yeah, had no idea you was northwest, either. Well, I know, yeah. mate. We could have got we could have gone closer to home, but I'm glad we did it here. <laughs> um, and you're a blue, mate. So you've had a belter because yeah. you just won the league. So yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. living yeah. the dream. Talk me back to your sort of formative years, because I, I believe, having spoken to you and planning this, a lot of your formative fishing was in and around that northwest region, wasn't it? Yeah, well, obviously, you know, I started fishing, um, well, just just general fishing, really, when I was about 14, 15. 
And even to this day, I've got no idea why or how, because nobody took me fishing. I never had no family members, no father, no friends that fished at the time. I think many years ago, um, I think somebody got me a just a cheap Woolworths sort of Christmas present, which was a split cane rod with a bit of a, a dodgy pike float on. And that sort of sparked the interest in fishing. And, you know, from there, I went out, caught my first fish. And I think from, from catching that first fish, it just, it seemed to ignite something in me. And, you know, it fishing was from then on, it was just fishing all the time. So, yeah, um, started from there, just got my normal float fishing gear that then quickly developed onto at the time it was swing tipping and ledgering oh, i remember those days you know it? yeah swing tipping ledgering lunching meat bread all on the hook pre hairy days um pre hairy days and um you know just just ledgering really with with friends and then one day i caught my first carp because previous to that it was all tension tension bream and um yeah caught my first carp and then quite soon after that i thought you know what i'm going to start targeting carp you know specifically and that's when you get you know you first you get your first set of alarms first indicators start using purpose-made baits and then um, started fishing the canals of the area and, and the local park ponds yeah did you what was that scene like at the time because it's it's quite you said pre herrig there mate so that's that's what 80s are we talking are we talking around there well at the time it was probably just before i left school so i left school in 1982 right and um I was fishing for, I know for a fact I was fishing for at least two years before that, um, you know, so yeah, it was, it was a completely different scene back, back in then days. There was, you know, there was, there was not very many, what you would call specialist carp anglers. And, and when I was fishing the park ponds and the local canals, you'd see these guys, you know, they'd have the, the camo gear and the canvas bivvies and I think it might have been Sundridge Bite Alarms at the time, BJ Bite Alarms, Sundridge Bite Alarms, you know, and the the knitting knitting needles with the washing up liquid tops on and um you know i used to go and speak to them and and, and at first to be quite quite secretive because back in them days it was so super secretive cart fishing and you know having met one or two of them three or four times on the same venue then they probably start to think well this lad's you know he's really interested and they start to give you a bit of time and you know give point you in the right direction and then before you know it you know i want to buy a bivy i want to get you know a purpose-made cart rod so yeah, that's how it started. Um, mainly on the canals, yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's it's great. From that point to the sort of carp bug, as you said, bit your your sort of northwest venues that sort of stick out in your mind as where to, where you went at the time to target carp. Was it very much canal based, or did you start to look at still waters? How did that whole thing expand? Because obviously, as you get more and more into it, things sort of develop, and you find yourself at certain venues at certain points, don't you? Yeah, well, it, it 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 did start really on the on the canals, um, and that was kind of ledgering. We was hoping to catch carp, but we was using baits that would, you know, did attract anything really. Um, and once we once I'd fished the canals for quite a few years, I ended up fishing a place in Altrincham called King George's. It's like a park park lake, and that probably would be the first venue that I ever fished where I was out and out, sort of targeting targeting the carp. Um, and I think this was probably round about the days, the the era where the hair was just coming out. So during my time at King George's, um, you know, I, I was using baits on the hook at first. And then after a couple of years, I saw this lad one day, he was fishing there. And um, he actually became became a really good friend of mine. He actually married one of my cousins. But we had, the first contact with him, we had an argument, both trying to fish the same piece of water. So it was a case of, you know, it was one of them. And then once we'd calmed down and I started talking to him, he said to me, um, are you using the hair rig? So I was like, um, I don't know what you mean, the hair rig. So he showed me this hook with a piece of line dangling from the bottom and a, and a boilie on it. I'd never seen a boilie before. And um, I was just like, you're having a laugh. You're having a laugh. I said, what? So you don't even put you don't even put the, the bait, whatever that bait is, this marble size thing, I says, um, so you don't even put that on the on the hook. He went, no. He said, you you put it on this little piece of line. It's about two inches hanging from the bottom of the bottom of the um, of the hook, and, and and you cast it out, and and the fish hooks itself. So I was like, no, I don't believe you. You're having a laugh. So he said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll meet up in the week. You can come to my house. We'll make some boilies, and we'll come back next week, and we'll use the hair rig. But you can use the hair rig for the first time. So sure enough, we met at his house in in the midweek, and we rolled. The first baits I ever rolled, and I can remember to this day, it was 
um, ready-made bass mix, Rod Hutchinson's Mingle Fruit it was at the time. Mingle Fruit. And it was a bait that you, you just mixed straight with water and you boiled it for a couple of minutes. So we made these baits up. You know, we spent about three or four hours one evening. We probably had about 300 baits each. So we rolled them on the Wednesday. Sure enough, on the Friday, we went to back to King George's. And um, he showed me the hair rig. We tied it on straight from the bend, as you do. And we, we you know, we, we cast it out, scattered a few baits around. And then I set my chair up then right next to the rods because pre rig days, you had to hit and strike the rod. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as, as your indicator was actually moving. Um, you know, pull the bait out, put, pull the hook out of the bait and, and hook the fish. So I've set my chair up right next to my rods, getting ready to strike. And he's going, no, no, you don't do that. He said, you just sit at the back and um, it'll go up and, and the reel will start spinning. So I was like, really? He went, he said, yeah. So I don't know, a couple of hours later, a little bit of a twitch and the bobbing shot to the top and the reel started spinning. And yeah, that's my first, my first bite on a hair rig. It was just, um, it, it completely changed i mean that particular lake was fished by a lot of anglers at that time and it was known to be quite a hard lake and then virtually overnight when the hair came it went from you'd probably catch four or six carp a year for quite a few nights oh, wow that is hard yeah for quite a few nights um and it just went from catching four or six carp a day they were just hooking themselves boilies were quite new to the fish so obviously they were just having him and um yeah, that, that lake really, quite a lot of Northwest anglers, I mean, a lot of the Northwest lads that are probably listening to this will know King George's. You know, it was the first lake I used a hair on. It was the first lake I used particles. The first lake I met quite a few of the lads. You know, Who'd you meet? Bernard Loftus. Um, oh, yeah. I met him on there for the for the, for the first first ever um, experience with Bernard Loftus was he was coming on and he was a, a far better angler than I was at that time. He was light years ahead of most anglers in the area. And I would watch him. I'd seen him fish it a few times and I was on there one day and I thought, oh, where's that lad? Where's that lad that was on there last week? We caught loads. So I'm already thinking, I need to keep an eye on you. I need to know what you're doing. And he went round to the opposite side of the lake and um, I could see him. I couldn't fathom what he was doing for the life of me, but it's obvious now. But I was watching him I was watching him before he cast and he was going up to the water's edge and he was just, he was doing something in the edge. He was just balancing his pop-up at the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I've got binoculars on him and I'm thinking what's he doing? Is he watching some sort of liquid that's that's coming out of the bay or, you know, just just couldn't figure it out. So yeah, he was just using pop-ups. He was the first person to put a pop-up in there and literally every time he cast it out, he was just getting a bite after bite after bite. Yeah, it's great. The yeah. actual angling on there for you, that obviously the revolution of the hair rig and I can't even begin to sort of yeah, compare that to really anything. It is even now. It's it's an effective rig, and it is damaging with regards to if you try not to use it, it'd be ridiculously hard. Yeah. But the fishing for you on there, your own developments apart from the hair rig and the bait side of things, did you did you start to sort of see a difference with regards to your own progression and other aspects and actually catching those fish, or do you think it was mainly down to that that leap in terms of hair rigs and baits? Yeah, I think I think it was where it was where my fishing went from really. You know, uh, I got serious about about my carp fishing on King George's. I mean, I met quite a few friends on there that that, that are still my friends today. Um, and you know, it taught me all about boilies. As I say, it was the first time I'd used particles. It was the first time I used hemp. I remember, I remember back in them days, we used to have a dinghy. You weren't supposed to do it at the time, but you get a little dinghy in the middle of the night and you go and put a load of hemp out. Um, it seemed like it was going out miles, but it was probably only about fifty fifty <laughs> yeah, yards yeah, yeah. out. You know, a load of hemp. Um, and then you and and then you'd sit there for, for for a couple of days catching fish and watching you know fizzers for the first time fish f- fizzing away on the amp and so yeah King George's was the first place I caught you know my doubles you know singles doubles um, bivvies you know mm-hmm. purpose made rods and it was there that I went on to I went on to to meet a couple of lads that used to fish there really regularly they were quite they were older than me and. Um, they would tell me about because King George had a closed season, just like most places did back then. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they would tell me about this place they'd go in the closed season. I think a place called Pills. I think you're quite familiar with it. Actually. I can't believe that yeah. you said this place when we were planning this. This is like I got to say, like less than half an hour from probably where I yeah, live now. Yeah, exactly. So they would tell me of for a couple of years. They'd say, "Oh, we, we go to this place called Pills with." Um, I think it had a couple of it had a small amount of trout in there that gave it the option that you supposed to be trout fishing really, but you know, you carp fishing and um, they were telling us about these 20 pounders. They were, you know, they'd been catching 
Now I'd not had a twenty pound by at this stage. I, it was just like up a double was my was my PB. And um, you know, after a couple of years of getting to know them, you know, they invited me. They said, you know, do you want to come next week? We're going to go. And um, of course, I just just jumped at the chance. Yeah. How did you find that? Because that's I'd imagine that's quite a different water, isn't it, Pillsworth, with regards to where you come from? How did you how did you sort of yeah adapt to that type of water? But was there anything specific, or was it just go there the same way, do the same thing, and hopefully catch them? Well. By the time I um, I got the invite to go pills, of you know, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of progressed on the boily thing. You know, I'd been King George's for two, two or four years. Um, I was fishing it a hell of a lot. You know, mm. I'd, I'd left school at this stage, and I think um, me and a very good close friend of mine, Andy Mulholland, we'd already made our minds up that when we leave school, we're going to go straight on the dole and just fish. You know, we, yeah. we weren't interested in doing anything else. So we'd done a lot of fishing on King George's, and we progressed from. You know the the Rod Hutchinson and 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 the ready made sort of base mixes to making our own base mixes. You know we'd been in the in the um, Kevin Maddox Cart Fever book and we yeah, looked yeah. up the recipes there and recipes that recipes that involved complan and wheat germ and all these different ingredients. So we'd started to make our own baits and um, yeah, it was quite good at it to be fair. So when um, when these two lads, Kevin was was the was the old one. When he invited me there, you know I just jumped at the chance. So I thought, right, you know what. What am I gonna do? I think I think I just started work as a postman at that time, and um, quite funny really because I think quite a lot of carp anglers over the years. Terry, yeah, I was gonna say yeah. a famous postman, isn't <laughs> quite it? A lot of carp anglers have chose chose being a postman because you get four days on, four days off, and you know you get quite a bit of time to fish. So um, yeah, we we arranged to go on this particular day, and I thought right, I'm gonna make my own bait this time. I'm not gonna use a, um, a you know a shop bought base mix. So um, I can I can still remember now the bait I used. It was. Um, it was semolina soya flour, um, maple cream flavour, liquid sweetener, liquid yellow colouring. So I made this bait and probably rolled about 300 baits after I'd been to work one morning. Um, and I left them to dry out in the sun while I just went to bed because I've been up since four o'clock. And um, went to bed, got up. And when I got up, I went to check my baits in the back garden. It'd been real hot and sunny. And they turned like, they'd gone like, they had white dots on them. They'd gone all sweaty. They had white yeah. dots on them. They were smelling like vinegary. So I thought, oh no, what's happened to my baits? And I was, I'm really anal about my baits, you know, yeah. over the years. I'm like, oh God, ruined. But I didn't have any time to do anything else. So I um, I thought, well, I'm going to have to use them. So I just put them in a, a large maggot tub we used to carry our boilers in back then. Just put them in there. Sure enough, the next morning, the lads picked me up and we went straight to Pillsworth. And um, we set up in the shallows, which is... Um, the field side of, of, of the lake, if anybody knows the lake, it's the field side, only about a third of the way up. And I was fishing in the middle of, of, of Kevin and Graham. It was a really warm day. And yeah, we went on to fish for two days. And some of that that has happened that happened to me on that session that has never happened to me since. And I have tried to try to reproduce it a few times. These vinegary, stinky, white, dotted, sweaty baits that I was using, for whatever reason. I had 22 fish over two days. Kevin and Graham, who were, the, who were the pills with sort of experts at the time, they never had a bite. So, I mean, obviously, late in, you know, in later years, you kind of learn about amino acids and enzymes and baits giving off certain signals. Yep. And uh, I still believe to this day that what, just by, by fluke, just by coincidence, the way my baits were breaking down on, on that particular session, the fish just could not... I could see the fish coming across, across the... Um, across the lads across, over their baits and they were getting to my area the dorsal fins were going down they were going straight down and yeah 22 fish in in two days and and, and they never caught anything so yeah, yeah and um, one of them fish was my first 20 pounder your first 20 pounder from Pillsworth mate first 20 pounder from Pillsworth yeah yeah unbelievable that I mean still now it's got obviously a really good head of fish in it but uh, even now when you look at sort of and you average out the northwest maybe take out the Cheshire Mears but a twenty pounder is a massive fish in the northwest. Yeah, mate. it still is. It still is for the northwest. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of lads still, you know, I mean, you come down south, you come to Grenville, and obviously it's just a different, it's just a different level. But twenty pounders, and you know, even now it's definitely thirty pounders. I mean, I've got a lake of my own up, up the northwest, and a thirty pounder in my lake is still an amazing fish. You know, definitely. Yeah, yeah. incredible. Yes. And that was back in the eighties, mate. Mad from Pillsworth, and that sort of first twenty. Did that sort of wet your appetite? For, for sort of bigger carp, if you like to go up and catch bigger, or was because when I think of you, yes, don't get me wrong, <laughs> you caught 60, you catch loads of big ones, but the venues you've been to, 
uh, it's not necessarily been an out and out big fish mentality through the whole thing. There's like bites. There's sort of the big fish chapters, which we're going to come to on Elstow and St. Ives. But with regards to this, w- was that a case of this starting out? You caught a 20, so you wanted to get a 30? Or was it just you wanted to move to a different venue from that point? No, I think obviously once I caught my first 20 um, from Pillsworth, you know, I think, I think we all want to catch big fish, you know, certainly when you, you know, when you, when you're that young, it's like, you know, I want a bigger one and you get that buzz. And, you know, I did fish pills with on and off for quite a few years from that moment on. And I caught many more twenties from there. Um, I carried on fishing back at King George's where, where I met the original two guys that took me to pills with, but then you started, started to hear stories, you know, you start to think of, like you say, the 20 pounders, Northwest area, you know, I was a young lad, I was 17, 18, never had no no car or anything like that. And then you started to hear of um, places around the area that, that I've got 20 pounders, some good 20s. And one of the places at the time was Smith's Reservoir um, up in Bolton. Now, I think most Northwest anglers, certainly most serious Northwest anglers have if they've not fished pills at um, Smith's at one time or another, they've certainly heard of it. And I heard about it myself, but, you know, I was a young lad. I never had any any transport. So I thought, right, well, I want to fish it. It was a day-only day only, day only um, water. You know, it was quite a cheap open access um, ticket, a Bolton club. And um, I used to I used to try and get the odd lift off my dad. He used to set me up occasionally. Um, but more often than not, I would have to get two buses from, from Withingshaw, Manchester, um, with uh, remember the old shopping trolleys that you see the old ladies pulling these square things with the wheels on. But to be fair, mate, Jacob Worth uh, he often yeah. drags one along the old the old <laughs> tube, mate. So I think they're still being used yeah, in the so fishing <laughs> sense. I used to fill that up with my tackle, yeah, the bed chair strapped onto it, and um, get a couple of buses to Bolton, and then literally I'd stay there for two or three nights. You know, coming off every night at you know dawn till ducks type fishing so you know 10 11 o'clock you'd come off and you're allowed back on there at four o'clock no matter what time of year it was you was, you was allowed back on at four so you'd sleep a couple of hours in the field and then you would and then you would go straight back on the lake and as we often find with these these day only type waters it's um you know the last couple of hours or the first couple of hours when the fish have generally sussed it that that's 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 a safer time to pick a hook bait up and um yeah, we used to sit there on the wall, anticipation with rigs, with bait already on rigs, and go straight onto Smiths, and um, you know try and catch, try and catch them fishing. It had some, it had some phenomenal fishing for for the time, the early eighties. You know, it had fish up to up to thirty pound at the time. Wow, how big a sheet of water was it? Smiths was quite a small lake. Yeah. Um, I would probably say about five or six acres. Yeah, um, it was a typical sort of northwest lodge, so it was man-made. Had a concrete wall around most of it. Um, the fish, as I say, it was my first experience of clued up fish, mm. fish that knew they were being angled for and, um, fish that, you know, they were quite hard to catch. It, it was, it was easy to blank, blank on there. And as I said earlier, you know, it, I think the lads that fish Smiths at the time, I think once you had sort of cracked Smiths, once you could be consistent on there. Um, you could really go anywhere. You you, you had the knowledge because it taught you about feeding times. It taught you about rigs. It taught you about bait, baiting, baiting strategy, all them sort of things. And once you um once you was consistent on Smiths, you know you could catch fish virtually anywhere. What were the keys to that to catching on there? Was there was there specifics? You said bite times. You said lots of baiting strategy stuff. What was the sort of I don't know eureka moment where you were like, oh right, yeah, I found something here that works. Well, I think I think back in. In, at that time, when you know the hair rig had not been out for for a long time, um, you probably see it in quite a few books of the time. There was there was many different versions of the hair that yeah. sprung up really quickly once the hair was sort of developed. So you had you know you had the spring rig, you had the hairs coming off coming off different parts, and it just taught me really that there were so many different options you could do that 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 fish were so cute, and once they picked a hook bait up. They weren't necessarily going to just, just bolt away from the area where they'd done that. They might stay there. You might get very small amounts of indication. So it then taught me and um, my fishing partner at the time, a guy called Barry Middleton, which many of the Northwest lads that listen to yeah, this, yeah. Uh, I've heard about it. I mean, he, he no longer fishes, but he was an exceptional angler back in the day. And, um, you know, when when I first when we first met me and Barry, it was just... It was a, a meeting of two great minds, I think. We just went on. We just both so complimented each other so much. In what way? What do you mean? Just, I mean, we was both so, we was both, 
very technically minded with rigs. We, we, we've always been rig minded. We've always been indication. You know, we've always always focused on indication. Whereas um, quite a lot of lads would just fish for like like a you know like a run, mm. like a screamer. A bit like what you just had, just <laughs> not long back, just, screamer, just, just from from nothing to something. Yeah, just but we. We developed on on especially on Smiths. The fish were definitely not. They were only as a last resort, picking your hook bait up and bolting. That was a last resort after they might have spent five or ten minutes trying to get rid of the rig. So we learned quite quickly that we had to have an indication set up that would register any sort of increase or decrease in tension on your main line, whether it was through a drop back or through a slight pull. We wanted that to register. On the alarms. Okay. So um, we used. Have you ever heard of pepper pots? We used to use. No, we used to get. Pot? You know, like a, just a normal pepper pot, salt and pepper pot. We yeah, used to yeah. get one of those, and we used to cut cut it out. And we used to make an indicator out of that. But there'd be a line across the bottom middle of it, and we'd put different different weights on it. So all, everything was was completely just balanced when it was all set up. So any slight increase would, would show. Yeah. Would show. I mean, it's a bit like. If you put a forty pound weight on a set of scales, yeah. If you add well, just one ounce onto that, you'll see it. If you take one ounce off, you'll just see it. So we was getting bleeps on that one ounce difference, where quite a lot of the lads that were fishing it at the time, they were just all locked up and literally they wouldn't get a bite until the rod was shaking and, and it would mm. just scream off. So it taught us a lot of the technical aspects of of fishing. I remember one time I did one winter on there, and um, have you ever, do you know what the buffer rig is? No, talk to me about the buffer rig. Yeah, well. Back in them days, as I say, everyone was, they got quite, quite quickly obsessed with rigs and different things. And everyone was sure on Smiths that, that the fish were, were sussing out the, the, the hook length material you was using. It was around about the same sort of time that Christon Developments came on the scene. And oh, yeah. We started to use the multi-strand quite a lot because yep. that was obviously, it's many strands. And the, the, the thinking behind that is it, it, it sort of flattens itself off and if a fish takes a bait into its mouth then it can't feel the line coming out. So we were all thinking down them lines, you know, of of of, of the fish sus- sussing the hook length out. So the buffer rig was where you would use literally a very, very light hook length. Now, the hook length I used, I used the three-pound hook length. Um, but behind, it would only be five or, five or six inches long, but behind that, you'd have a three or four-inch section of strong pole elastic. Ah. So it would buffer. When you're playing a fish, it would give it the buffer the... The shock where the fish is turning its head wouldn't snap the three pound, um, the three pound um, hook length that you was using Bay of Pearl at the time. So I remember we used that one winter, and yeah, you know I caught I caught loads of fish on it. You know, outfished everybody else. I was using Tricast Diamond Light rods at the time, which wow. were they were only two and a quarter pound test yeah. surfing was really soft. So so yeah, you know that was just one of many rigs that that started the process of thinking about rigs and. Chatted out with the carp on the on the rig side of things. Where's that? Where's that come from? Has that always been in you? That sort of I don't know. It's always an engineering type mindset like that, and the the sort of just fishing acumen. Because obviously you're fishing a lot. We talked about the fact that there you like after school you were like I'm just gonna fish, and you spent a lot of time on these real sort of rich breeding grounds if you like in the northwest. But there's got to be something inherently either in you or in your personality that 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 has meant that you're sort of oh, natural is probably not the right word, but you're able to sort of process that information, take it and sort of use that information to then set yourself apart catching fish. Because like you say, you've caught them in the winter. There's a lot of people who fish those venues who, who really struggle. Like, yeah. and, it, and it's not through a lack of time on there necessarily. I think, from what I see, it's through a lack of sort of maybe using information, interpreting, and having that sort of engineering mindset to, to make things happen. Yeah, I think I think what it's been with me is um, I've always had a like a problem solving type type mind. So, you know, even when I'm doing well at anything, I'm always I'm always constantly thinking, trying to understand why am I doing well, why am I catching, um, how can it be improved, you know. So even when I mean I've said it I've said it many times over the years, even when you rarely you never blank. Now I call a blank. You know, some people call a blank. Oh, um, I've been fishing and not caught anything. I don't call that a blank. I call a blank not learning anything, going somewhere and not learning. So I don't mind going to a lake and not catching, as long as I understand why I've not caught. You know, so as long as I, as long as I, as long as I, if I learn something from a lake, even if I've not had a fish, if I've learned something, seen another situation, seen the fish 
react a different way. As long as I'm learning all the time, as long as I'm trying to problem solve, that I'm I'm completely happy with that. So I think yeah, I think that's where it's come from the you know the rig thing and um, more on you know the indication thing. I mean when we when I left um, when when we'd finished with, with with Smith, we went on to a really really well known northwest water at the time, which was which was treetops or top flash. Mm. Fish that you know and. Um, it was there that the indication side of things really kicked in. You know, all the experimenting we'd done at Smith's with the pepper pots and the balanced indication, you know, we took that to 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 Top Flash and, you know, that was just, it caught so many fish, just, just being able to, to be on it with, with the indication. Another influence water, another hard water. I know Rob Gillespie's talked about it. A fair few other podcasts, um, Northwest podcasts have talked about the same the same venue. But what made you leave Smith's? I think what made me leave Smiths was um, I'd caught quite a few of the fish. Yeah. You know, the majority. Caught the majority of the fish. And then, um, you know, getting to an age where you've passed your driving lesson, your driving test, get in a car, and then suddenly you're, you're starting to look further afield. Um, so, as I say, you know, I teamed up with Barry Middleton at the time. We, we, we'd both got vehicles then. And we probably did what, what most Northwest anglers have done at, at that time in the eighties, which is you get your ordnance survey map out and you're thinking, right, this weekend, let's go and explore all these bits of blue yeah. in in the Shropshire area, in the Cheshire area, you know, all all different different areas around the Northwest. And we must have looked at most bits of blue um, at that time around the Cheshire area. You know, all the waters that you know later years they they became really good waters, Petty Pool. Quite a few of them, and one of one of the spots of blue that 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 we just walked onto, we never had no information on it or anything was top flash. Oh, we walked on there one day, and we knew something was different about this place because the car park was full, right? You know, and um, the other places there'd, there'd been no anglers, and um, so we, you know, the car park was full. We walked down there one day. We didn't have no permits. We shouldn't have really been on 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 the lake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we did get quite a frosty reception, to say the truth, but. As soon as we walked on, you know, we saw some of the well-known Northwest anglers that were fishing it, and it was obvious then that there was there was something special in there. So, you know, a little bit of investigation work, and soon found out that it had massive, massive carping for the area. You know, it had fish up to thirty pound, and um, I think this must have been. It was very, very, very early nineties. This was, and um, you know. Once we discovered it, for thought, right, well, we need to fish this place. We need to fish it regular. So we managed to secure ourselves. Well, I secured my ticket first, but I didn't get a ticket straight away. And it was the it was the last two weeks of this particular season in the early 90s. And I thought, well, I'm going to give it a go. You know, it closes on the 16th of March and I've got a couple of weeks to fish. So I got dropped off up there and um, I fished the last 10 days of this particular season. I thought I'll fish it. I'll come off. It was days only again. Another day only water. Yeah, I thought you know I'll um, I'll fish it for the last ten days and I'll, I'll I'll just see how I get on. So yeah, sure enough, I went on there, fished it for the last ten days, and um, believe it or not, I caught the biggest fish in the lake on my on my first trip. You yeah. joke? Yeah. You see it show? Did you go on anything, or was it what what mate? What led to that capture? Well, that capture was basically. Um, I went on there. And I can remember that. I can remember the bait I was using at the time. This was in the Premier Fish Meal days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think Spice um, was it. The, they did a Red Spice Spice mix came out. First of all, they had the basic fish meal. Then they did a, like a Spice fish one. Um, so I made. I was using that. I got contacted. I got contacted by um, Dave Chilton at the time, who who was running Christon. And he just bought out Ambio. Have you heard of Ambio before? Ambio, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like oh, a, that is. it's like a very, very early version of the like Minamino type liquids. I was say that is early though, isn't it? Yeah, he just brought that out, and you know, he he gave it a couple of the well known sort of Northwest lads, and I was fortunate enough he gave me a bottle of it. So I thought, right, well, this is um, I loved it straight away. It's got like a raspberry flavour to yeah. it. It really complemented the spice fish mix from Premier Bakes that I was using. So I decided, right, I'm going to use that for this for this coming session, my first session on on top flash. So I thought, I want to put as much ambio in this bait. I I'd, I had heard actually that Bernard, Frank, the Tomlinson twins, they were like the elite Cheshire anglers the of the boys, time. Yeah. I had heard they were using it, but they were using it as a bait soak. So I decided, right, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I'm going to actually put it in the bait in the egg mix and 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 use it in the bait and try and get as much ambio in the bait as possible. So I tried to put. 
sort of like 10, 15 mil per egg in and it wouldn't go through the bait roll. We used to have these, you know, the old bait rollers. We used to yeah. Have. So I thought, right, what I'll do is I'll hand roll them. So I ended up putting 22.5 mil per egg um, in and I hand rolled all these baits. So they were really high concentrates of ambio in it and then I soaked them after it. Didn't have many, many baits. And um, yeah, I took that on this session during the course of that session, um, fishing amongst the Cheshire Stars sort of thing. I had, I think, uh, if I remember rightly, I had four bites. There's about 10 carp caught on this, this last 10 days of the season. I had four of them. And um, one of the bites, I'll never forget, a bit like yourself when you said you was, you was shaking. Um, Go on, mate. Just a, just a bit, a bit back. Um, I got this bite one afternoon on the on the meadow of, of the lake, and all the lads were there. It was all fishing quite close together. So I get this bite, and I'm playing this fish. I've got Frank on one side, Bernard on the other. I'm like 18, you know, my knees are going, <laughs> bottling it, I am. And um, so I'm playing this fish for quite a long time. And then as it gets a bit closer, I think it was Lee Tomlinson who was stood behind me. He rolled the fish and he went, oh, it's the big one. So I've gone, what, what, what do you mean the big one? He went, oh, I had it last last October at £32. Oh, no. So bear in mind, my biggest at this stage is probably £24, £25. And... Um, so yeah, knees going. I'm thinking, oh my god, don't mess this up. You know, I've got everyone around me, and so yeah. Cut long story short, I managed to get it in the net, and um, I think the rest of the lads basically took over then because I was in bits. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, got this fish, got this fish on the bank. It was pre unhooking my days. I've still got some pictures of it somewhere where I've got like a carp sack on the grass, <laughs> yeah. and um, yeah, weighed it. It was I think it was thirty pound, twelve ounce, my first thirty. So absolutely just blown away, but. Blown away, end of the season soon came. But yeah. one thing that happened after that is uh, I, for the close season, I'd made my mind up. I thought, right, okay, you've had the biggest fish in the lake, but now I want to go back and I want to be consistent and I want to catch. Because it's kind of fluky, really, you know, third bite, biggest fish in the lake. You know, you, I kind of considered it, considered it to be quite lucky. But that's a lot of bites, four bites. Yeah, four bites. It was that then you? Yeah, yeah, it was, you know, um, no doubt, you know, Back in them days, Cheshire Mears, it was very long hook lengths, light leads. You know, you're fishing in silt. Mm. Um, you know, not a lot of bait stringers. So I just thought, right, I'm going to go back next year and I want to prove I can be consistent. I want to prove that it wasn't fl- wasn't fluky. I want to prove that I wasn't lucky. And um, so, yeah, I fished probably top flash for another three or four years and did really well. You know, some of the best anglers on there were catching on my lead up to my first year, they were catching maybe, I don't know, the, the top rods were catching between 12 and maybe 16 carp per year. Many lads were struggling. A lot of lads were blanking. Yeah. Um, I think my first, when I went back and did a full season on there, I ended up, I think I had something like 34 bites. 20, that's 20, sickening, isn't it? 26 fish. Um, quite a few of the, of the known big fish. Um, but what's most noticeable out of them 30-odd bites I had, I bet you probably only 28 of them actually took line, actually were runs because we'd balanced. We balanced, as, as I say, from Smith's. We'd, we'd yeah. come with this indication thing where everything was balanced and it was very sensitive. Um, I was convinced that on top flash especially, probably more so than any water of fish since, the fish were definitely not, choosing to bolt once they'd picked a hook up the first reaction was to was to not move at all was to try and get rid of the rig and then the last reaction was obviously when they thought oh, this is just not happening then you get a bite so most of our bites most of mine and barry's bites especially in the winter time were just where it would just literally it would lift a quarter or a half inch just get a one or two bleep so sort of back in them days you just put in the real fine um you know the the fine fans you can put in your optonics in your alarms with loads of veins on <laughs> yeah, giving yeah. you loads of this is before like you know the, the proper ones yeah of course and um you just get a couple of a couple of bleep lift and many a time i'd be there someone would be talking to me and i'd just go beep beep and i'd go that's a bite what and you'd hit that and i'd wind you know i'd grab it wind down and sure enough yeah, there'd be a fish man. on the end and they'd be like oh my god how did you know that was a bite you know because most of these lads i was walking around the lake and i was talking to the lads and I still do it now, really. I, I speak to lads and say, oh, you know, what are the bikes like? You know, mm. and most of them would go, oh, you don't have to worry about the bikes, mate. Just one toners, just one toners. So as soon as they were saying that to me, I was like, well, you're missing. There's something you're missing there. You know, you, if that's what you're getting, then you're doing something wrong. And sure enough, 
most of mine and Barry's bites were just slight lifts. I mean, if he wasn't on your rods or he was in a sleeping bag or you might have been off You're your missing rods. Him. Yeah, it, it, it would develop, but most of the time it was a two inch lift and there'd be a fish on the end. You wonder if you're talking 30 odd bites and the nearest being sort of 12 teens, you're wondering how many actually do materialise. Because as you say, Ned, there's a big discrepancy in there. Oh, taking into account everything else, it could be bait, it could be location. There's all those factors in. But if people are getting one or two bleeps and it's not materialising, I reckon that's probably happening half the time by the looks of it if yeah. you're having 30 odd bites. So that's, yeah. that's impressive, mate, that is on there. Yeah, it's de- I mean, it's definitely happening, you know. And, you know, when when they saw our success, there was a few anglers that obviously took note and started to sensitise their indication system, and, and they went down the same same road that we did. How were you generally received around like the scene? Because obviously, there's a lot of incredible anglers there. The North is, as a scene, from what I know of it now, and as I said, I'm an adopted Northerner, so I wasn't there at the time. Was quite guarded. It was quite. It is still quite guarded in terms of a lot of places because of the scarcity of big fish that sort of distributed around the area. Were you going on there, getting so many bites, sort of not upsetting the apple cocks. I'm not saying you're doing anything to do that, but you're going in there and getting bites, which draws attention. How how was how were you received by everybody? Generally well. Um. No, not really. <laughs> no, no, no. I think. I mean, it was common knowledge at the time that you know before before let's call them the outer towners you know you, you had the local lads that had been fishing top flash since the fish were like double figures mm. and they'd slowly watch these fish grow and get to upper doubles 20s and you know and half a dozen upper 20s and, and, and the bigger 30s um they had already seen the likes of you know the bernards and the franks and, and the other lads that were they were quite tuned into the the northwest scene at the time and um you know so they'd been there a couple of quite a few years and they kind of been accepted but it was only a matter of time, really, before the word got out, and and the likes of myself and other anglers from around the around the northwest area started to turn up, and we weren't really received that well. There was a couple of you know the local bailiffs they used to make things a bit like anywhere really, just just not not really making things difficult for you, but just watching, you're just making sure you was on at the right time, you was off at the right time, you wasn't breaking no rules. And you know there was there was there was a little bit of friction, you know, back in them days. I was only eighteen, so I was kind of bullish myself, and you know, you know, thought I knew it all, and rubbed a few people up the wrong way. But eventually, you know, you get accepted, and um, but like you say, back in them days, it, the, the the scene was very secretive. It was you know across the northwest. If there was a good good fish in the water, nobody wanted you to know where where it was. But we soon settled in, and it, it turned out all right. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the northwest scene, mate. What like. Where did you go with regards to that? Because there's places that I know about that I've done in other podcasts and covered that you haven't really been to or haven't really touched on or fish you haven't really targeted. They're probably synonymous with the Northwest. I'm going to go the Deer Park. I'm going to go the Park Lake or whatever. For you at that time when you finished on Top Flash, was it a case if you've got a motor and I'm heading down south for bigger fish? Or, or what, what sort of went through your head in terms of that decision-making process at that time? Yeah, well, as I've, as I've said, the the top flash days were the days when I first passed my test yeah. and started to get a car. Um, so during the course of fishing that sort of water, you know, you're starting to hear, and I was meeting a few people that were talking about travelling down south. You know, you was looking at the 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 angling press and the magazines that were out there, and you're starting to hear about Darrenth and the Yateley Car Park Lake and all the original sort of iconic waters from back in them days, and it was them that sort of captured my imagination and rather than one biggest regret I've got of, of my fishing career is not fishing Reedsmere. I fished Reedsmere once again in the very, very early eighties. It was day ticket at the time. Um, I fished it just the once. And then by the time I got a car, I was sort of like looking to maybe move on from, from top flash. I'd been hearing about the eight, the car park lake and Darrenth and them sort of waters. And, um, that was basically it as far as Northwest goes for me. You know, I did come back to the Northwest many years later, you know, Wireside and places like that. Um, but from sort of late, sort of mid to late teens, it was, it was Darren. I went straight to Darren. That's crazy, isn't it? Cause you think like that is a big move, isn't it? To go straight in sort of, you're at the deep end up North. You're doing really well. There's a few waters you could go to. Reads me, reads me you've named, but there's others. 
And then you've decided to go straight down to Darren, which is the deep end down there at the time as well. That's another melting pot of incredible southern anglers, isn't it? Yeah. How did you find going on to that complex? Was it, obviously there was a bit written about in the media and a bit of attention drawn to it at a point. When you got on there, was it very much still at its formative stage with regards to a lot of the sort of top anglers that we, people would know? Or was it a bit more established, those guys? I think Darren, when, by the time I fished it for the first time, it was, um, it was in its heyday. Yeah, it, it was certainly in its heyday. You know, there was there was a lot of the lads that I met during the course of fishing Darren. Um, they went on to be, you know, bait company owners, fishery owners. A um, lot, a lot of lads that went into the. I mean, they were all young at the time. Mm. You know, they all went into the industry and became really successful. Um, but you know, we started fishing Darren just with the. I think it was the premier bait still at the yeah. time, Spice Fish Mix and all the rest of it. Um, and during the course of fishing Darren, there was a few lads that were starting to that I started to notice on on the lake that were catching quite well, and um, one of them was this bloke called Zenon Bodgeco, who yeah. yeah, who had, who you know I I spoke to him a few times, you know, and I'd, I'd caught a few fish myself, so he'd sort of spoke to me and Barry a few times, and um, I kind of noticed that he was coming on the lake most weekends um, with another lad called Paul Hunt. Paul Hunt runs Canadian Carping now over in Canada. Um, they were sort of fishing together. And this was in, I didn't know at the time, but this is in the very, very early days of mainline baits being developed. So I could remember, even though me and Barry were catching fish on the, on the spice fish, I could remember they would come on on a Friday afternoon. They'd fish the sort of open water end of, of, of the big lake where it's just a big expanse. There's no islands, no bars. You're just fishing into open water. And they would... I would watch them get this bait out and they would stick baits just randomly all over all over the, the, the open water area down by the road end and um, just be sticking baits for about an hour and I'd, I'd be like that to Barry. I said, how much bait are they putting in? Just boom, boom, boom. They're putting all this bait in and then, you know, they'd stop and it'd go dark and then um, sort of an hour later, you'd do it, do it, and then all weekend, do it, do it, do it. And I'm thinking, oh my God, what? And, and, at the time they were developing the Grange, it was the the first yeah. time the Grange was being put into into any lake, and they were just smashing it. It was just, I mean, the Grange. Everybody that 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 used it, the orig- certainly the original one, will know how how devastating that was. Corn steep lifter was being being offered to the fish for the first time. It was it was devastating, and um, after a year, probably only my first season on 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 Darren Big Lake, caught quite well. You know, I, I caught a few fish myself, some of the well known big ones. And um, Zen came to me and Barry one one day and said, um, "Would you like to use the bait that we're using?" So I says, well, "You joking? Of course, because I'd watch yeah, him, you're smashing. I'd it. watch him catch all these fish." <laughs> so yeah, so that was my first um, ever sort of contact with with mainline baits. We'd go and pick bait up. We'd after we'd done a session, we'd go and pick the bait off of them, the original Grange, um, and that was you know that lasted quite quite a few years. You know, Grange activate, assassinate. Um, even even the protein mix they brought out, we used the whole array of mainline baits um, from when they first came out. The captures on there was it was it a case of obviously that bait being introduced and that having the sort of a stronghold on the venue, but the actual captures in terms of significance going from the north to the south. What did that feel like to you? Did it feel like you were sort of I don't know made a real big leap in your carp angling to be able to transfer it to a sort of an infamous water down south? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, I used to go back to the Northwest after I'd done my, my sort of like sessions down on Darrenth and, you know, I was talking to some of the lads on, on the local waters and, you know, where they're talking about doubles and twenties, you know, I'm talking about twenties and thirties, mm. you know, so it was, it was a complete, you know, levels, levels above anything else that we'd had, but we'd had the, um, we'd had the, the, the sort of like the history of Smiths. We always went back to Smiths because, what Smith taught us with the indication and the rigs, it soon became quite apparent that the rigs were not a problem. You know, we were still very, very rig rig minded on Darrenth and we was you know, some of the some of the rigs we used on there, you know, we used to use, you know, four inch hut lens. We used to use a lead that was about three inches long with about a three inch stiff section coming out of the back of the lead. So that was all six inch, if you can imagine it. So it was a three inch lead, three inch stiff section with only a four inch hut length. Right. And we used to put a little square polystyrene block on the hut length, cast the lead out, it'd go around the back of an island, then we'd pull it back up the shelf of the island before 
before the um, polystyrene had a chance to to melt, we'd use the binoculars to look under the bushes, and then we could see the polystyrene pop up. We'd call that the rig was then set, so we'd know the rig was set, and you know we'd catch catch fish that way. It was we was always using something different back in them days, and it always used to work. You know, massive hooks, sea hooks, very small, very small pea sized boilies strapped to the back. Right. You know, just. Just try, always try to think. Always experimenting, didn't you? Always experimenting at the time, yeah. Always experimenting. And, it, you know, it, it stood us in, in great stead. We caught more than our fair share. You know, it was a great time. And, um, yeah, you know, Darren Firm, iconic water, wasn't it? it was <laughs> how, what would you compare between that, that northern scene and how it was down south, mate? Was it very different or not? I think, I think with the northern scene, you always had to try and work harder for your results. So, I mean, back in them days, there wasn't a lot of anglers that were travelling um, down south. Right. You know, whether it was, you know, the famous Yateley Car Park Lake or or um, Darrenth. But the lads that used to travel were generally the lads that had done well in the northwest. Mm. I mean, I remember a famous capture. I think Bernard went to Harefield in, in, in the late 80s, it might have been. And he took um, Richwood, Richworth ready-made tooties, tooties there for yeah. the first time. You know, loads of him. And he had a historic catch. I can't remember exactly where he was, but he caught more fish or 30s than than, than anybody had ever caught before. So generally, I think the lads that, the Northwest lads that had decided they wanted to go and try these Southern waters, they'd always done quite well. They were always quite confident with us, with their abilities. And, you know, I think if you've, if you've, if you've fished the Northwest and been consistent and successful, then it pretty much stands you in good stead to, mm. to, to be consistent and successful anywhere really significant moments and captures on Darren for what stands out when you look back at that I think significantly um, a lot of my time was winter time on there right. even back in them days and I still do now I, I, I love the winter time you know obviously generally there's less anglers on the bank obviously it's harder you know less bites um, but I, I don't know it's just it's just it's just uh, I've always loved my winter fishing so with that in mind you know um I, I had many sessions where I caught quite a few fish. You know, I caught there was a couple of fish called the big, lin, big, big, big and little linear in there. I caught those. Probably one of my most favourite captures out of down of Big Lake, and it wasn't even the biggest fish. It was probably one of the oldest carp in there. It was a fish called Mad Max, and um, I'll never forget. I caught that on a on a February morning. It was about minus four. It had been freezing cold. It was the kind of the kind of um, scenario where you think you've not got a chance. And yeah, had caught Mad Max. I think at the time we was using Mainline. There was a protein mix that Mainline did back in the day called Profile Plus. Now what we used to do, we'd go down there and we would we'd actually roll our. We'd take enough bait for a couple of days, yeah. And then we'd sit on the bank and we'd roll our bait <laughs> as we was fishing. So yeah, Profile Plus protein baits, plum flavour. Um, you know, I caught I caught that on that. Yeah, so that was probably one of my most satisfying fish, even though I caught bigger. Um, yeah, it was that, but eventually we decided to move on because I think it's been quite well documented that um, Darren did change. You know, there was new owners came along and um, the fish stocking policy changed mm. and, and, and things changed quite quickly then. And we got to a point where I thought, you know what, it's, it's time for us to, to move on and go elsewhere. What was the elsewhere move, mate? Talk to me about that. Because obviously at that time when you're you're on a place and there is such a nobody really could foresee it that change i don't necessarily know if you had plans to go elsewhere at the time but when your hand sort of forced as it was what's she thinking there back up north no well no it wasn't um wasn't really thinking about back up north it was more a case of you know during the course of the time that i spent down at down at darren obviously this was in the heyday of you know it's cat fishing was really starting to get a bit of a grip there was a lot of anglers starting to do it i think it might have been in the the start of the maybe carp talk days Okay. Big carp. There was, there was quite a few purpose that sort of like ready made, you know, purpose carp fishing magazines and weeklies that that were coming out. And obviously, we used to just, as most most carpers did, used to get carp talk every week, and you'd go through it. And where's this one from? We'll look at the size of that. Yeah, yeah. So that kind of put quite a lot of waters on your radar. You know, you was asking about, oh, what what about this water? And I think we saw a picture of, um, I think me and Barry saw a picture of the mother one day that was in Elstow Pit Two at the time. Um, we we were fully aware of pit one because in them days, 
pit one was probably one of the most prolific 30s waters in the country. Yeah, it was the Grenville of the day. Yeah, right? it was. It really was. You know, there were some really good anglers fishing it and it was known for, for, for being a, a 30s water. So initially it was like, how do we get one of these pit one tickets? Anyway, at the time we found out that you just can't walk onto pit one. You've got to get your name down on the waiting list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, you've got to go through the pit two sort of the, the feeder water first. So we thought, well, that's fair enough. What's in pit two? Oh, there's a fish called the mother in there. So I thought, well, what, you know, what's that? Oh, it goes low 40. So I thought, look, that'll do. So we got ourselves, um, we decided and we got ourselves a, a, a pit two ticket. And then on the very first session to pit two, we was told that the mother had died. Um, apparently they'd been, they'd been, it had not been caught for three years and there'd been quite a few very good, well-known anglers that had fished for it. Mm. Um, not been successful, left. And in their opinion, did not see it in their opinion it was no longer there so we believed that we just thought well you know what's the next biggest fish in there anyway there was a fish called the twin which yeah. was again low 40 upper 30 low 40 and there was quite a few upper 30s in there epilepsy scaly there's quite a few yeah. fish so um we thought well you know we're quite happy to fish for fish for them while we're hopefully hoping to get on onto pit one so that was how we started um our, our pit two sort of journey story that's a different water altogether mate though isn't it i mean i know you've stumbled across that for a pit one ticket but the challenge of let's take the mother out of the equation even though she's in the equation and the twin that's very much like what i would see as like top end low stock big carp hunting on a on a difficult water mate deep not easy mate at all to fish that place very sort of feature dominant and feature rich but a completely different prospect to the likes of, I don't know, Darren, where you've got an all right head of carp there, haven't you, mate? Yeah, obviously on Darren, it was, everything was completely documented. They knew yeah. what the biggest fish were, they knew what, what the A-team were, so to speak. And um, on pit two, it was a completely different, different style of fishing. You know, it was very low stock. I, I'm not sure at the time. I think there was maybe 30 carp in there at the time. How many acres? It's, it's, it's a fair few acres, is it? Yeah, I think it's probably... 60-ish acres, it 50, mm, 60 acres. I was say it's pretty similar to this. You know, at the time coming from coming from Darren, you know, as a young lad, it looked like an inland sea to me. It was <laughs> it was absolutely massive, you know. And you'd been told that the depths in there were down to thirty odd four. It was you know mm. the huge volume of water, very low stock, but we weren't phased. You know, we was just you're running on your keenness in them days. You know, you're, you're young, you're up for any challenge, and 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 we had the time, so. um yeah, you know, we, we, we started we started fishing there. I think that was obviously mainline days again, you know, by this time it was it was well into the active eight, mm. sort of boily boily fishing. Um yeah, we just started fishing there. We know we had no idea what we was gonna catch. And um I actually had a fish on my very first session. Yeah. You had a fish on your first yeah, session. I couldn't believe it. We went down there in February and it was more a case of going down just to you know, just to get your bearings, to see the lake. The recce, sort yeah, of. Yeah, the recce, really. Out. So, yeah, um, second morning, second morning on, on, on there, I had um, had a fish off off the, the point peg. It's only 24 pound, but it was like, I've achieved I've achieved the impossible, you know, it was great. And, and that was it then, the, you know, the, the fire had been well and truly lit. Me and Barry were really up for it. And then for the next, probably for the next two or three years, it was the only place that we that that we fished. Was it was it a case of targeting the twin, or was it just being there and getting a buy on that type of venue was was sort of the draw? What was it? Yeah, I think on. I mean, even though you know when you're fishing them type of waters that you're never going to get you know loads of bites, mm. um, and I fished a few of them waters over the years, but I've always never really wanted to just even though you know you can't discount the fact that there's a big one in there, and at the time it was the twin. And you always hope that that might come along, but even when I fish those waters, I don't, I don't, I don't like some lads might only fish at certain times, new moons, because the big ones got form for coming out. They might just fish certain areas because it it frequents them areas. I've never done that. I just concentrate on trying to get myself bites. I always think just get yourself bites, and whatever's in there will come along, you know. So it was just a case of keeping your eyes open, you know. It was. It was probably, that was probably the first water that location was obviously with such a small number of carp in there. Location was paramount. You had to, you had to learn to look 
and you know, you, I mean, you see it on some 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 lakes now, you know, some you, some you'll speak to lads on the, and you'll ask them if they've seen anything, and they'll say, "Oh, I've not seen anything," and and but you've been watching them, and and they've not got out of the bivy till half past ten yeah. in the morning, and they just these lookers, and then these lookers, you know, and over the course of the years, you meet some lads that, and there's a couple of lads on air actually, and and it's funny because the lads on air that I've noticed are really sharp when it comes to location and spotting fish, knowing what's happening. They're all the older generation. Right. You know, the lads that have been at it for years, sort of my age, and there's one or two that fish here that are even even older. And um, they are so sharp, you know, and we learnt straight away that location was everything. So we would be up in the night, we'd be up in the mornings, and literally you would not want to take your eyes off the lake all day. You know, you're making a cup of tea, and as you're staring, as you're staring at you, you're watching, and, you know, everything is, is, is glancing back to the lake, glancing back to the lake. And obviously, if you see a fish, just like I did then, actually, <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you see a fish, then you've just got to move. So that was that was probably the lake, the first lake that taught me the importance of of watching, of looking, and 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 how important location is. How did you find that sort of that play out? Because it, if I think about it in a textbook sense, there's a lot more waiting or a lot more time in between bites. You've been to some difficult venues. You've already referenced up north where you've done well. And you've had, I'd say, a greater frequency of bites on there. You caught one on the first trip. You're fishing the same venue, but just by the nature of the stock, I can't imagine you tear through that in two months and you, and your job done. H- how did you find that whole process? Because it's, it's a different, it's a different style of angling, isn't it? It's a completely different style of angling. Totally different. And even though you're not catching and and you're doing a lot of blanking, you know, um, well, as I say, it's the blanking thing again. You know. I just, I, I approached it, or me and Barry approached it as, um, it's just a, a, a puzzle, a problem. And I've always been into problem solving. Mm. So even when we weren't catching, if I was to do a session, not catch a fish, but see them in a certain area, or see them in a certain area in the morning, certain area at the, the night time, on that drive home, I'd consider that to be a result. And because I consider it to be a result, I'm then already planning the next session. You know, I want to get back down there. And I want to try that that area, and I want you know. So, you know, lots of looking, lots of obviously feature finding that again. You know, probably the first lake that taught me the importance, the total importance of feature finding. I mean, pit two is like an egg box is in places. You know, yeah. it's got bars all over it. You know, you've got the depths. You know, first lake probably that. You know, you've got to get your head round fishing in 25, 30, 35 foot of water. You know, so that wasn't easy. You know, it's you're casting out and it's taking that long, and you've not fished anywhere. You know, Cheshire Mears generally are quite, are quite shallow, quite shallow, silty and shallow. So just yeah. getting your head round, fishing deep water. You know, that was something else that we had to deal with. How do you find all that? Pretty easy. You strike me as a very like. I wouldn't say, yeah, scientific. I said engineering before, but that sort of mindset where, like, as you say, you're faced with a problem and you can suss it out. You seem like you've got a very, like, astute sort of, I don't know, like, carping acumen, mate. Naturally, I don't know. That. Yeah, I think, I think you know, you just got to think of it as, the, you've got to look at it in the carp, the carp sort of world. You know, they're born in that environment. You know, mm. even though we're thinking, all oh, right, I've only been fishing, you know, Cheshire Mears at six, seven, eight foot deep. You know, these fish have lived in this, this environment all the life and really you know 40 foot might sound deep to us but you know you look at a look at a, a street lamp at the side of the road and you know it might be 40 foot and you think well that, that's it. It, it it's not a lot you know yeah. certainly to a fish it's not a lot so we soon got our head around the depths you know the different topography of uh, of, of of the lake bed and it, it became quite soon within about a year that most of the fish were being caught within 10 15 20 yards of the of the bank anyway, you okay. know, on the margin shelf drop off, you know, it was onion weed at the time. And, um, you know, location, fish movement, how fish reacted to different weather conditions. And generally, I mean, what I learned on there, I still use on Grenville today, you know, fresh winds, what the fish do in a fresh wind, large lakes, unpressured, they generally do follow the wind, you know, certainly in the summertime. So it became quite easy for us to figure out. We always had an idea that if we turned up on a certain day, and the wind had just started blowing a certain direction, then the fish probably will be in a certain area. So we go and check that area out first. Eight out of ten times, the fish would be there. So it was just a learning process of how fish behave with different, you know, weather conditions and 
my view. Were you baiting pretty like heavily in, in certain areas, or was it very much a case of you go down there and just see where wherever conditions sort of you could see a show and then set up on them? Yeah, we were. Um, I mean, at the time we thought it was heavy baiting. You know, right, yeah, it yeah. might be might be half a kilo of bait. You know, over over each rod or a couple of kilo on on an area. So at the time we thought, you know, that that was heavy baiting, but obviously, you know, many years later you come to, to lakes like Grenville where you might put, you know, a lot of bait in yeah. compared to then. Um but we was more it was more reaction fishing on there, even though we was always trying to predict where the fish would be given whatever circumstances, whatever weather conditions we had. It was nine out of ten times you you you'd set up in an area and the you wouldn't get it spot on. You know, the first right. like the next morning you'd see them just down the bank or or somewhere so there was quite a lot of there was a lot of moving on there you know the fishing in a certain area you'd move you'd fish for him um you might be successful you might get a bite and then that same evening as it's going dark such a small group of fish on there you know you'd see the same fish you'd seen show in front of you at first light you'd see 150 meters away as it's going dark so you'd have to move yeah you'd have to get on him um so yeah, and uh, I think it was my second season on there when I actually I actually caught the mother, which we didn't even know was in the lake. That must be some buzz. That oh, that was absolutely incredible. I mean, that that particular session, um, I don't know whether you know Pit Two or know the history of it. it used to have um, like a what you call a back bay, where yeah. the fish would go when they spawned. Yeah, it was a small channel of about twenty yards that would lead into this bay, and then it was about a, a one two acre bay, and. Um, on this particular trip, I'd had a look in this bay and I'd seen, I'd seen the reeds moving one afternoon. So I thought, right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand about and I'm gonna look for a bit. And I could see this fish. There was two fish there actually. I could see these fish in the reeds. I had no idea how big they were. They were just, just too deep for me to, for me to um, identify. So I put a bit of bait on this margin shelf, and first like the next morning, I went back and it was gone. So I thought, I'm fishing the main lake, and I'm on a quite a good peg on the main lake at the time. So I was quite reluctant to move out of it. But this bait had gone, and I thought, I can't ignore this. You know, it must have been them two fish. So um, sure enough, I packed up, fished on this, fished in, in, in the bay, just casting a short distance across to this to this margin shelf where I could run round and literally throw my bait in. I did that, and um, during the course of that night, I had two bites that night. Two bites. Two bites. In the night. On in the there. night. And the first fish was a fish called Scaly, which is a really well-known documented yeah. fish in in, in, um, in Pit 2. And it was known that that fish used to used to hang about with the mother. It used to, did, did, people would brace it. And you, do you think you'd have seen the mother before this or not? They're just no, nothing? No, not, I, I'd, I'd definitely not seen the mother. I'd seen fish, big fish. But, you know, at this stage, anything that I saw that was big, I was probably thinking was the twin which was the only fish, the only big one that everyone believed was still in there. So, um, yeah, during, during this night, I, I, I had a bite, um, landed this fish scaly. I think it was 34 pounds. <sighs> sort of Italian-y type scaly thing. Absolutely lovely fish, beautiful fish. So, obviously, um, pictures of that were done. And a couple of hours later, I had another bite and um, an, an, an epic battle. It was close quarters, soft rods back in them days. Mm. Um just, just a mega bite, you know, everything, knees shaking, and managed to get this fish, um, massive fish in the moonlight into the net. And we looked at it, and I went and got my mate, and, and we looked at it, and I, I, said, I said, it's got to be it's got to be the twin. You know, this, that, that's the only fish in here. Yeah, there's nothing else. You know, we've just caught scaly hours earlier, and this fish is visibly, it's not one of them where you're thinking, you know, is it, it might be bigger, is it bigger? It's <laughs> yeah. like, no, this is, it's, it's massive, it's well bigger. So... We photographed it, put it back, sorted it out, put it all back. And then one of the regulars came along and um, I explained, obviously, this was the days of cameras where you have to get your film developed and all the rest yeah. of it. So one of the regulars had come along and I explained this fish that we'd caught, the scale pattern and all the rest of it. And he said, you said, you've caught the mother. I said, well, I thought it had gone. He said, well, we all believed it had. But from what you're saying, it was £42 at the time, my first £40. <laughs> Absolutely immense fish of the time. And um, yeah, sure enough, it turned out that the mother or that had not been seen for for three years, I think, at the time, lived and breathed, and I'd, I'd caught it. Couldn't believe it. That's incredible. I can't imagine the buzz of not only your first forty pounder, two bites on an incredible venue in a night, scaly, which is a big enough buzz, and then that 
like yeah. resurrected after three years. Well, was there anything particularly different that you did rig wise, anything like that, that, that you think potentially could have tripped it up? Or do you just think it was, I don't know, the right time and you were in the right place? what do you think? I think it was more the right time, right place. Um, you know, back in them days, um, I had started to use, uh, as I say, I'd always been sort of quite rig orientated. Mm. So I was always having the thought process of, you know, what my rig's doing. Could it be improved? Are the fish um, getting away with, 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 with the rigs and, and what have you? So I don't think I had a special, it was more really, it was more really right time and place. Them two fish were in there. Um, you know, I'm not trying to say that I was doing anything different at the time. I think anybody who would have been in there on that particular night probably would have caught them two fish, you know. So, yeah, nothing special. Obviously, after that, I fished the lake for, for quite a few years after that. Caught quite a few fish still. Is this still in waiting for a pit one ticket or is this because you just fell in love with the place? Well, it was a bit of a, I had, I had a bit of a sort of two sides to, to Elstow pit two because I fished it for quite a while. Um, while I was waiting to get on pit one and caught the mother and other fish. And then I had a break from pit two and went f- back to the northwest. It was the first time I'd gone back to the northwest for a long time. Um, that was mainly because I'd started to hear whispers of this place called Wireside Fisheries right. up, up Lancaster Way. So I started to hear that, obviously, you know, it was 30 pounders, mid 30s, even upper 30s, the two big ones in there. Um, Paul Print and Hoover at the time yeah, and, and, and Sea Scale as well. That, that was a mid thirty. Um, you know, we started to hear about that. So that actually took us took took us away. We caught a few fish from Pit Two. And then while we were waiting we, for the Pit One tickets to come up, we thought, look, let's see if we can go and get a ticket for this place called Wireside. So, you know, we made a few inquiries, a bit of a waiting list, went up there and fished Bamptons first. I think Bamptons was a was Bamptons there, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Bamptons was a day ticket at the time. Yeah. And um, having done a couple of sessions on the day ticket Bamptons, we we got quite friendly with Bob, the owner, and um, he offered us um, a wireside ticket for the syndicate. Talks about wireside. I've met loads of people over the years, to be fair, are fishing Clearwater, which have fished wireside. They're old wire boys and fished the original sort of wire syndicate lake that you're talking about there. As a as a complex, I think I've fished it once or twice. And yeah, the fish are incredible. It's weedy. It's beautiful. It's a nice, co- really nice complex. But I think a lot of the fish that are in wire, obviously now very old if they're still knocking about, but a lot of them have gone as well, haven't they? When you went, poor print, the likes of were in their prime, weren't they? Yeah, when we when we first went to the lake, the the, the wire side was definitely in its prime. Yeah, you know we'd we'd heard about it for a few years. There was there was a quite a few lads from the northwest that were you know three or five years in front of us. Um, I was hearing about Pete Hall House in Huntingdon. They were they were regulars up there. They were they were there from the early days, and you know all these stories of them catching you know upper twenties and mm. and thirties at the time. You know they'd, they'd come through to us. So when we first arrived there, um, I believe that at the time it was quite a big particle water. They were using a lot of particles on there and. We'd come, obviously, we were still connected to mainline baits at the time. We were around with, um, I think it was Activate, we were around with at the time. And straight away, the lads that were fishing, it, you know, they were kind of saying, look, by all means, crack on with your boilies, lads, but you'll probably not catch much because this is a particle water. So we were like, okay, well, you know, fair enough. But we were adamant we weren't going to go down that road. We were just going to, well, kind of fill it in. We thought we were filling it in at the time, but, you <laughs> yeah. know, three or f- two or three kilos per session. But in was, relation to what everybody else is putting in, you're putting in more, aren't you? Yeah, we're putting in more and we're putting in something that's completely different to what they're using. You know, we were just going straight in all in on boilies. They were all using hemp, particle mix and um, and they were catching fish. But it it, it it was an absolute myth because right from the off really, we started catching straight away. We was putting loads of loads of boilies in and um, yeah, I was catching pretty much, pretty much straight away. The lake, the topography, the sort of style of fishing obviously we talked about boily fishing how did you go about it just radically different to everybody else by the sounds of it from the get-go well at the time we um as i say was using the activate went straight in on that um there was about four of us that joined at the same time me barry and a couple of other lads and i'd kind of i was still looking i was still still very riggy at the time and i remember the very first season on on the wire side I reverted back uh, back from all the soft braids 
I've been using quite a lot of the Christ on braids leading up to that, you know, the silk worms, the multi strands, all them type of things. And I don't know why, but I decided to go straight in on straight nylon hut lengths. Okay. So it was, um, you know, like an 11 pound nylon hut length. Probably at the time, I think it was using the, the B175 hooks. Yeah. Um, just so, so quite a basic rig. And some of the lads in the Northwest would probably remember this, but we had a rig that we called the Withingshire rig. Now, the Withing the Withingshire rig. rig. And it was literally, it was about a strip back as you could get. It was a lead straight on the line, no bead, just a, a swivel with your hook length on it. And where you where your main line tied down to the swivel, yeah. we would we would do an um, an extra large knot. So instead of doing eight turns on your blood knot or whatever knot you use, we'd do about 15 turns. So the knot was big and twice as long. So then what we'd do is the lead would slide down the main line and it would sit actually on the knot, not on the line itself because yeah. the knot was long. It'd sit, it'd sit on the knot itself. Now, the reason we did that was because even though now, you know, it's not, not classed as long range fishing, but there was quite a couple, quite a few long chucks on, on wire side. How at long? The, at the t- they were probably only, they were probably 100 yards at the time. Right. You know, n- not long. You had um, you had the point swim, you had um, the swamp swim, which was probably the furthest chuck, maybe 110, where he's casting to the island, tight to the island, to these rhododendron buses. And because it was long range, we used to get, in the early, in the early sort of, sessions on there we'd have a few crack offs because was again it was just conventional bead fishing with a with um, a little bit of tubing and you led on so i discovered that we, we could get extra strength out the line by doing a massive knot and just having the lead come down and sit on the knot so it was completely stripped back no bead no nothing and we'd we used that for quite a long time and um yeah we, we did great and the lads on the lake you know, they called it the Withenshaw rig. The Withenshaw rig, yeah. mate. Incredible. Yeah. We're going to come to talk about bacon rigs and all sorts later, mate. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, on there, the actual sort of capture of, of the sort of named fish. Talk to me about those, mate. Because obviously, like, when you come to a venue, I know you like bites and you're pretty pretty good at getting your feet, getting off the ground running in terms of those. But the capture of those bigger fish, was there anything significant that you did to capture those sort of name fish? Was there anything, was there areas or anything like that? Or was it a case of just the same way of just going about getting some bites and the big ones will turn up? Yeah, I think for me, um, I mean, there was always, as there is on most lakes, there's, there's, there's a few pegs that are what you'd call the going pegs, the mm. pegs that do a good percentage of the bites during the course of a year or all of a, all of a season. And on there, one of them pegs was the point peg. Um, prolific peg, 80-yard chuck to the corner of the island. You know, I spent quite a lot of time in there. Um, the baiting strategy was starting to romp up a little bit. We were starting to, instead of take two or three kilos, we were taking three or five kilos. Again, it was, I think during the course of our time on the wire, we used, you know, we used the Active A, the Assassin A. There was yeah. quite a few mainline baits that came along, and we used them all and caught loads on them. But as I say... With my fishing, I think it was just, it was I, I was just always, always trying to get bites. I was always in the point. I was always again. I was following the wind. You had the bench at the opposite end of the lake. Whenever the wind went down there, I was fishing there quite a bit. Um, and yeah, it was just it was I was just just going through the motions. Lots of boilies, you know. Quite soon, the rest of the syndicate started to switch from from particles to boilies. Um, you fishing clear spots, or are you fishing in the weed, or what were you doing? No, it was quite clear that the right, lake generally okay. um, was quite clear. There was a couple of pegs, sort of in the margins, and for the first ten or fifteen yards, the clay bar area used to get quite weedy. The steps there was few. There was a few pegs where you you would get quite a bit of weed. Um, but what happened on on? I think Wireside really was, as I say, I've always been rig minded, but mm. it was my experiences on Wireside that kind of really reinforced what carp were doing to me, um, were doing to anglers in general on rigs because the lads that were using the particles in the early days of of uh, my time on there, you could use the boat. And it was quite often the lads would go out um, towards the island in the boat and they put their hemp and groats or party blend or whatever they would use. They'd put that down, they'd fish, put the boilers on it, cast out, put the boilers on it, see a couple of fish show sort of like as it's going dark, first light, and then they go out there dinner time the next morning mm. and all the hemp and stuff was gone same old story that you've heard you know yeah. you heard all over the place all the hemp and stuff were gone 
the boys were still there or they might have even been moved. So that was the first time we was hearing these stories. And I was like, I was always, I was always, I, I'm not getting it. How can a fish move, you know, pick up a lead and a rig and move it from A to B, maybe two or five yards. So that was the first time I'd actually seen with my own eyes that fish were kind of getting away with it. And that I was starting to believe that our rigs that we were using were ineffective, really. And um, I think the the final thing for me was I was fishing a peg on there one day called the clay bar. Now, this peg was where it was, he was casting across the corner of the lake, only a short cast, maybe 30 yards. He was casting across the corner to a tree line. And what he was, what he was, what he was able to do then was run round the corner, and climb through the trees and get on this branch. And you could see where, where your rigs were landing. So I was fishing this one day. And I thought, right, you know, I'll, I'll cast out, I'll run round, and I'll put some bait on top of yeah. on top of my up baits. So while I'm there, I'm um, while I'm there, I put a bit of bait on, and I'm just about to, to climb back through and go back to my rods, and there's about half a dozen fish coming down the tree line. You know, it's it's sunny, the water's clear, it's about four foot of water, so I can see these fish coming. So I thought, I'm going to stay, I'm going to see what happens. So these fish have come along, and my bait's sort of like underneath, under, right underneath me. I can see it clear. Boilies, yeah. Boilies, a little bit of particle mix at this time as well. Okay. A little bit of particle mix, mainly boilies. So um, these fish come along, so I froze, and I saw them come along, and they literally, I couldn't believe it. They just, it was a bit like a, a formation of fighter planes. You know, they spotted the, the baited area, and they all at the same time just tilted and just went straight down and oh. just nosedived into the ground, into the late bed, and we just, just started clearing up. So obviously I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to get a bite any second. Yeah, we're done you know, There's my boilie, you know, they're, they're less than a foot away. And, you know, they're scoffing all the boilies. So getting closer and closer to my hook bait. And one goes, next minute I can see my hook bait just, boom. Didn't, didn't go over it. I saw the hook bait move. So two two inches away from the hook bait, it was sucked in. So the hook bait disappeared into the fish's mouth. And I'm like, yeah, bite. Bite, bite. Anyway, the next minute I just saw it fly out. So I'm like... What and this fish it didn't spook. It was the, the fish just did not spook at all. It, it carried it on just, feeding. It just went onto the next boilie at the side, carried on feeding, yeah. and then the fish at the side of that one eventually sucked my hook bait in again and did the same thing. So I'm like, oh my god, what is going on? This explains everything. All the all the stories I've heard from the lads who are fishing up by the island, getting cleared up, but not getting no bites. I thought this this is obviously what's happening. So you know, I was there for half hour. And my hook bait must have been in three or four different fishies' mouths, probably ten times. <laughs> one, one of the times, actually, the fish did try to blow it out, and the, and the, the the hook almost pricked it. But at that stage, the fish did do a little bit of a upright and and move, and I saw the hook then straighten, and then the bait got pulled out. Right, still didn't hook it. So anyway, after about half an hour of this, and the fish the fish sucking and blowing many times. One of them hooked it, and he eventually got a run. Obviously, went back to the went back to my rods and caught a fish. So that was it. That was it. You know, the the light bulb had gone off then, and it yeah. was like, it was like, how do we ever catch a fish? You know, it's, <laughs> my mind's blown. How do we ever? But what I could see, one thing I could see, I was using basically a knotless knot type scenario in them days, and um, I could see that when the fish was blowing, blowing the the rig out, the the bait was the the hook was being turned round. The bait was leaving the mouth first, and the hook was being turned round, and it was coming out bend first. Now, obviously, if a hook's leaving the mouth bend first, the chances of it pricking and hooking yeah, and minimal. catching yeah. are minimal. So I left that session, went home, thinking I need to do something with my rigs. The rigs are ineffective, and I, I don't for one minute think I can make the perfect rig um, that will give us what what. What what years later I'd call the hooking to sucking ratio? How many times does it get sucked in? To the amount of times it get you actually prick or hook a fish. So that's the hooking to sucking ratio. So I'd seen the hooking to sucking ratio of these rigs were ridiculous. They were ten, fifteen to one. So I thought, right, well, I'll go home and if I can just stop the hook being turned round in the fish's mouth, then maybe that would increase the hooking to sucking ratio. So obviously back home. You know, filling the bath up with water, starting to experiment with rigs, and this was before the 
phenomenal stiff hinge rig that that you know, Terry and Nick Nick Hellier yeah. developed. You know, um, so I was thinking on them lines, but back in them days, there was no such thing as. Um, so stiff. you wanted a pop up, did you? Pop up, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there was no such thing as stiff bristle filament in, if, uh, yeah. filament in them days. So I thought, right, what I'll do is. I will make my hook length up or a section of the hook length behind the hook, the first two inches, two or three inches, with as stiffer, as thick a material as I can find, stopping it. I mean, you can imagine if you was to pour a straw in your mouth mm. with a hook on it, you can't turn it around because yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's, stiff, yeah. it's wider than the cavity of the mouth. Yeah. So I thought, well, I'll just try and achieve that. Put something in there that's wider than the cavity of the mouth to stop it turning around so it goes in that way. It's got to come out the same way. So um, the only thing that was available at the time was, um, was it the old amnesia hook lengths? Yeah, yeah, okay. I think they were up to 25, 30, 30 stiff, pounds. Stiff, yeah. Yeah, at the time, stiff. Not compared to now. Not but, now, but you know, yeah. St- it's a lot stiffer than anything we had at the time. So I made a couple of rigs up with them. Popped up, um, but the majority, sort of like three quarters of the hook length was was all, you know, soft, supple, silkworm or, or whatever it was using. And then the last two inches was amnesia, stiff section with a pop-up on it. So I thought, right, I did a few bath tests with the, the tube. That, the tube that I, I've the still got today. Mate, the, yes. When doing... did that tube come into play then? Because that basically, for anybody who's not seen it, and you should see it, it's, it's basically a tube with like, is it like what is it like blue tack or so? what do you put on? Well, Pl- blue tack, plasticine. Um, I think the original ones that I made was actually a material that I put around it because I, I just thought right. I'd use that. But you know, I made one. I've still got one at home now, and that's just blue tack. Um, two two open ends of it. What both ends are different diameters, so you know wider and narrower so um I it simulates a, a cop's mouth doesn't it you like yeah, it creates a vacuum, it. i mean it? don't get me wrong you know i'm not i'm not trying to say that if it works on the tube it's going to work on a car but yeah. it's the general principle of being able to see what rigs are doing on the suck and blow movement so you know in the bath i made up these amnesia sort of rigs popped up two two and a half inch and on the test in the bath you know i was sucking and blowing my original rigs the rigs that i'd seen the carpet wire side suck and blow many times. Mm. Um, so they were just totally ineffective. It was, you know, five, six, seven, ten to one hooking, sucking ratio. So I made these other rigs up and straight away, they weren't perfect. Straight away, it, it, it came down to like three or four to one. So they were twice as good. You were winning though. Yeah. Yeah. I was moving. I was going in the right direction. So I thought, well, that'll do. You know, I'm not going to try and make the ultimate all singing, all dancing rig. If I can just get the percentages coming in my direction, then it, it should increase my chance of catching. So armed with those rigs, the new rigs, I was back the week after. Um, same peg, exact same scenario, sunny days, the fish were going up and down the tree line. So I was so keen to get in there, so I chucked the rods out, exact same areas. I put my rods on the rest, got my little bucket of boilies and a bit of hemp and pellet and stuff. I'll run around there, I'll be able to see the rigs, see my boy, my, my baits and bait up over it, put the put the tub up, I got to the edge of my peg, did it, did it was gone straight away. No. So I thought to myself, oh, Here we go. I thought that didn't have the time to do it, to hook and suck to hook and suck and blow many times. That had to be a an instant bite. So obviously I landed that. Um buzzing, I thought, right, yo, you know, I think I've, I've sussed it, it's working. So I rechucked it, went back to the Back to the tree line. I had the time this time to to watch the fish come down, bait it up, watch the fish come down. Literally, I think it was it, it was a one on one straight away. The first fish that came along to it sucked it in. Probably you know got a real shock. Tried to shake, couldn't shake. You know, so yeah, I think I had about double figure double figure fish that that session, and that was really that you know that was the first version of what. I'm still using today, which, you know, some lads call the bacon rig, some like to call it the long blowback day rig. You know, that was the early stages of that. And over, I don't even know how long it is, 20, 25 <laughs> years ago, over all them years, the same principle of a stiff section that doesn't allow doesn't allow the hook to be turned round. Obviously, Terry Hearn and Nick Hellier, they, years, a couple of years after that, they yeah, came the along hinge. with the stiff hinge. And as yeah. soon as I seen that stiff hinge, as soon as the stiff bristle filament came along, and as soon as it was, oh, uh, you know, this rig's doing all right. As soon as I seen it, I, it just, I thought, brilliant rig. It, it made complete sense why that was catching so many fish at the time. And yeah, you know, even to this day, that, that rig that I made has been tweaked and changed 
to the rig that I'm using now. Well, I saw it recently. I saw it with the OMC components and a lad, I think he's on here, who's obviously seen the, the, the good work that rig's done. But just to come up with the sort of the tube and the test of a carp's mouth, a lot of people use a palm test. They'll pull it across their palm. A lot of people will do different things. But I don't think I've known many people to go to the lengths of sort of making something that reciprocates how a carp feeds in terms of a vacuum using a, a bit of plasticine to mimic a carp's lips and then going from there mate that's like that's another level on from it let alone when you see and i'm going to call it the bacon rig because i think i remember seeing it and thinking that is it looks it's out the box but in terms of the results and we'll come on to this place and what you've had out of here and places where you've taken it there's no doubt in this this sort of out of the box thinking has definitely equated to more carp on the bank for you, the development, and you talked about it very briefly, but to extend that to what it looks like in today's form, and I'll overlay a picture for the people to see it if you're watching on YouTube, but for those that are what, sort of listening, talk to me about where that's gone in terms of what it looks like now, because it's developed on further from from just this little stiff section. It's now a, an altogether different beast, isn't it? Well, um, obviously, with the success of, of um, the original rig that, you know, of that I... Uh, that, um sort of invented on on wire side um just before you know go on to present day and how that rig has been developed you know from that from that particular time um developing the rig you know i went on to catch most of the fish out of wire side you know paw print um how big was paw print mate um well i actually had them both on consecutive sessions um <laughs> caught <laughs> caught one <laughs> caught one one session and then went back the week after and caught the other and um i think it was I think paw print was 38 and a half and mm. Hoover was 39 something. I mean, they're massive for that region, aren't they? I mean, at the time, you know, they were huge. I mean, I think the Angling Times um, had a double page spread of red, red, you know, obviously it's, like, it's Lancashire, isn't it? So it was red rose record and, yeah. and all that. Yeah. So massive fish at the time. And, you know, it was that, definitely that rig. My, my run ratio went up. Um, straight away and that was what really started you know it, 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 it emphasised everything about rigs and one thing I did notice when these fish were um, visiting the area is they didn't seem to have any caution all this you know for many years I'd, I'd, I'd been told and I'd, I thought that carp would come onto a, um, a baited area with you know very gingerly a load of caution feeding for lines if anything was too shiny, they would they, they they would not come onto the spot, and I was seeing the complete opposite. I was seeing confidence. It was as if, it was as if. I mean, one sort of analogy I've used many times over the years is, if you've got a um a per, you know a house burglar who burgles houses who can disarm any any and all um burglar alarms, you know they can nothing they can get past everything. Then they will walk up a drive to a house not bothered about or oh, the alarm might go off because they're thinking you know, I, I can I can sort the alarm out I can disarm it it was as if the fish had that sort of attitude whenever they went onto the baited area they were just straight on it they were feeding confidently they were sucking they were sucking up baits in blowing them out there was no caution whatsoever so one thing I thought well well if that's I can, I can maybe maybe I can use their confidence against them i.e. that means I could probably offer them anything um, rig wise, you know, Frank Waddick brought a rig out one time, the anchor rig with yeah, with with the anchor with, rig with, with the shot. line coming through yeah. the back. You know, um, there was even rigs back in them days where hooks were actually bent into like a like a funny shape, you know, and the fish were still picking them up. So that all played into my theory, which was, don't worry about what your rig looks like because the fish are that confident they can get away with it. They will they will come and feed on the spot. And they'll suck anything in. I mean, let's not forget these fish can they can feed in silt and they can separate a bloodworm from silt and sand and gravel and weed and all the rest of it. So they are experts at sifting and filtering. So because they're experts, they're, they're, they're so confident. So I thought, well, I'm not going to worry about what my look, look, what my rig looks like. I'm not bothered about the size of hook. I'm not bothered about how long the stiff section is because they'll suck it in, and I'll use their own confidence against them. So that's really when i started to think about developing the rig that more is today because originally it was a stiff section a bit just just like the stiff hinge a stiff section with a small loop on the back of the hook and the bait was virtually pinned to the back of the hook just like a like a normal d just like a normal d yeah yeah yeah. 
So that's how it started off. And then eventually I started to think, is there a possible way of making the 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 bait separate and, and a bigger D? So to get a bigger D, you know, the, the D's got to go beyond the eye because obviously the D's all come back around onto the onto the eye. So it's got to be beyond the, the eye and maybe go down onto the onto the hook length. Why did you go that way <laughs> as opposed to, if I'm thinking a bigger D, I'm thinking I might do more whipping turns up the shank and maybe going longer out the other end. Do you know what I mean? So, so just making literally a so bigger you, you a know, bigger you D. see like an IQD rig or you see that where you've got a longer D and a bit more travel for the bait. You've gone, no, I'm not going to make it longer in terms of that. Maybe even using a long, long shank hook, you've got a bit more length there. Yeah, you've gone yeah. the other way where the D is pretty much from behind the eye where the whipping is down onto the actual hook length. Yeah. Well, I think at the time there was... I had seen a rig very, very similar. Um, there's a very, I mean, you might even know the guy. There's a, a really well-known Northwest angler who was an exceptional angler, uh, Mark Tunnicliffe. Yeah. Um, Tudge, we know him as. Um, he was fishing, you know, wire side at the time. Um, we'd sort of rub shoulders with each other on Top Flash and Clifton Marina back in the day. And um, again, an exceptional angler. And, you know, you'd be silly not to watch what exceptional anglers do. And I noticed quite soon that he was using a very, very similar rig. It was on a, it was on a supple hook length, but again, it was it was a long sort of D thing that went down on, onto the hook length beyond the eye. But that was all quite soft. But it was really successful for him. So I'd always, I'd seen that and noticed it, and I so I that sort of started my thought process of a long D that returned down the opposite way rather than the other way. So it was just trial and error, you know, started to tie things up. Um, try them in the bath, you know, seeing how which way it sucked and blowed and then using it, you know, hooking, sucking ratio again seemed to be coming down. My catch rate seemed to be going up. And then, you know, over the years, in the last probably five years, it's I would kind of say it's almost complete now. It's almost, uh, you know, I'm struggling <clears throat> to see um, any more benefits, anything I can add to it. Because over the years... You know, it's developed from a longer D, um, a stiffer D. You know, mm. literally the D now is it, it, it's mega stiff. Um, and also the hook. I mean, the bait now, when the bait is, is when it's all popped up, I, I generally fish it quite slow sinking. So when the when the bait is, when it's all popped up, obviously the, the, the bait is the buoyant section. So when it gets sucked into a fish's mouth, <coughs> it, is, it is all very slow sinking. So when a fish does suck on it, I assume it travels fast and it travels far because some of the hook holes that I've had over the years. I yeah, mean, this is what you said to me. I mean, ridiculous. I've got some pictures that I'll, 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 I'll give you to, to use if you want. Of, of um, I use a split shot about two or three inches below where the D attaches to the hook length, and on some of the pictures I've got, the split shot is just about visible. So the hooks, you know, so the hooks that far into the you mouth. You said to me you had to carry a pair of forceps, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I need I need forceps because it, it's. You know, it's common, you know, 20 times a year. Uh, well, I can't reach the hook. And it's also interesting that you're talking about that that sort of r- slow sinking pop-up because I'm going to take here for an example, mate. I've only had one bite of what we're talking about. But you know what I mean? The fish are decent. They're big fish. You think of the amount of ruckus they must make when they come on a spot and there's multiple sort of groups of them. They yeah. would smash the living life out of the Yeah, spot. they do. They do. And... um not always slow sinking. It depends on the situation. Okay. Obviously, if I'm fishing um, an area where I know there's a bit of chard, where I know I'm not, a little bit uncertain on the ground. So basically, the dirtier um, I suspect the area might be, the slower I might have it sinking. Obviously, okay. the, the cleaner I will have it. I will have it sinking quite, quite fast and quite nailed to the ground. Um, but what probably happened? I mean, one of the more recent. And I probably, I've never actually mentioned this. I've, I've spoken about this rig quite a lot mm. over the years. And, you know, there's been short videos and pictures being put out there. And, um, you know, one of the main advantages that I've, I think I've taken the rig a little bit extra the next level is I use I use the heaviest hook I can find on the market. The heaviest hook. Now, some lads will be... They'll be chatting to me on the lake, and and they'll and, and they'll see the hooks I'm using, and they'll, you know, let's say it's it's a double X hook that I made for fishing rainbow, or you know, hook and hold mega strong hooks. They'll say to me, you know, you're fishing open water. Why are you using 
why are you using hooks so so strong? They think I'm using it for the strength. Yeah. And I've never actually said this to anyone because I always get that bit back. But no, it's not. I always, I use them for the weight because obviously once the bait is, once the fish tries to to, to, to blow it out of, the, uh, out of the fish's mouth and the bait slides down the length of the D, then the only thing that was holding the hook up in the first place was the buoyancy of the bait. So once that bait is transferred to the opposite end, the weight, the weight of the hook, depending on the weight of the hook, the, the hook wants to fall. So obviously... The thought process for the last sort of t- only only the recently the last couple of seasons I've been thinking I need to use the heaviest hook possible. So as soon as the bait and hook separate, the hook drops down instantly. And the rig itself to explain it, and we'll put some images up so people can see it because it is very unique. But to explain it and the actual tying process, you've obviously got hook strongest you can get, as we said, heaviest you can get. What type of pattern do you use generally? Generally a wide gape. Okay, wide gape. Wide gape beat point. Okay, is what I've always used. But having said that, you know, I, I don't. I'm not saying it wouldn't work on a straight point, and um, I'm not even sure if the lad that has documented it recently. I think he might have tied it up with a with a straight point. So, but I generally use a wide gape. I always believe in wide gape hooks. Um, the, the wider the the better beat point. Um, and as I say, strong as possible because, I mean, if you can imagine. You know, when you go on the fairground and you try and throw one, and you see one of these games where you've got to throw a, a bean bag through a through a small hole, yeah. And, and if you get it through, you you win a prize. Now, obviously, the smaller the hole, the harder it is to do. So, if you've got a really tiny, tiny hook and a really tiny, um, you know, pop up or twelve mil bottom bait or whatever, and and you've got a fifty, sixty pounder sucking and blowing it, mm. the cavity of the mouth is so big, massive. It just can go, it can go in and out so easy. So. Given the situation, obviously, if I'm trying to fish extreme range, then I'll I'll, I'll go down on the hook size and, and and the bait size. But given the situation, I use quite a big, you know, 16, 18 mil pop up with a wide gape hook. Try and make the bean bag. I'm trying. Try yeah, I see what you're saying. You know, try and get the ratio more in my favour, so there's less chance. So there's more chance of it hitting the sides as the fish tries to blow it out. And the actual the actual running, let's not talk about the D element, let's take that out. So so to initially tie it, is it a case of what how do you com- do you start with a D or do you start with the actual running length? Because it's coated braid, is it? That it's the main running length of the yeah. rig. What I use is I use um semi stiff to stiff coated braid. Right. Um always quite long hook lengths. I've always been a long hook length man. We got ten inches more. Oh yeah, at least ten inches. At least ten inches. Sometimes, again, depending on what I think I'm going to be casting the rig onto, um, the the hook length will be of various lengths. Um, but what I use is I use a always semi stiff or stiff coated braid. Now I will let's say it's fourteen inch long, the hook length itself. I will have the I will strip the hook length either either end of six inches, or you know of of, of four inch either side, and I'll leave about six inch coated on the on the centre section. So when the rig is actually tied up, and I'll tell you how it ties in a second, when it's tied up, cast out, and it's sinking slowly, because you've got a supple three-inch section close to the clip. Yeah. That can sort of collapse. And then the stiff section hits the deck, and it'll just drop down. Falls out away. And kick out. And you've got the, the supple section on the end, allowing the, allowing the actual rig itself to be to be cocked up. How do you it. attach that to, the, to a lead system? I just use a big a big loop with a figure of eight knot, okay. so yeah, it yeah. just goes on, just, just clips on, dead easy. No worries. Um, but when I'm tying the rig up, I mean, it's a really, really, it's a difficult rig to tie. I can tie it with my eyes closed now. Um, obviously, all my mates over the years that have tried to tie it, you know, they've, they've they've come back with their versions of the rig, and you know, it's not quite right. It's quite hard to tie. It's a whipping knot that I use up the shank. I use about twenty turns on this knot because I want the I put the the stiff section along the back of the shank first. Yeah. Then I'll do the whipping knot. Yeah. Long whipping knot because I want the where the stiff section comes out of the top of the knot and re- and returns back down to the up length. I want that to be quite high up. Whereas on where do you want that level with the barb or what? Higher. Higher. I have it higher. I, yeah, I have it at least level with the barb. Like on um, the bend almost. Just before the bend, just okay. at the start of the bend. I have it at least at least barb, but maybe as high as start of the bend, um, and then it'll return return back to the to the to, to the hook length itself um obviously with the original you know um the original original d rig it was only a small d quite, yeah. quite on the back so it was all quite low but i like it you know over many years of, of looking at it in the edge i want the hook to be as underneath 
debate when it's all set as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so um, you know, quite a long whipping knot. It, then you, you bring it all back, you put your ring on. And at that, at that time, you've got to decide how long you want your D, whether you want the actual D. If you want to fish it, you know, as I have done on clean ground, you fish it quite low. So it's only a short D. Or you can fish it up to, you know, a D that big or a D that big up. The length of that D denotes how how sort of high a pop-up section yeah, is. The length yeah? of the D is determined by how high you want it off the ground Okay, when you're fishing it. But also, the length of the D has got to be determined by the average size fish that you're fishing for. Because if you're fishing for, like a Grenville, for instance, average size 30, 35 pound, obviously the cavity inside that fish, fish's mouth is larger. The whole point of the D, of the, of the stiff section, is to stop it being turned around. So if you've got a real short stiff section this much mm. and a 40 pounder sucks it in, it's possible that it can still turn it around and blow it out, you know, bend first, which is not what you want. So you've always got to have in the back of your mind how big is the average size fish in the lake. If it's massive, you'll use a bigger D. Right. To, okay. To, to stop the turnaround, you know. And also, you know, you think about what I'm, what I'm casting on. So I remember um, when I was on my Stone Acres days many years ago, uh, I was fishing there and I took these rigs there. Um, and this particular session, I, I, I went on and there was fish showing down the bottom end of the lake. I had no idea what the what the topography was like, where the clear spots were, but, but, but the fish were there and they were showing it was daytime. So obviously I didn't want to get a lead out. I didn't want to start plumbing it or marker flowing it. So I just got my rigs out. I got some quite high ones out, three, three and a half inch ones out. And I thought what I'll do is I'll just put my, my rigs on. I'll fish some slow sinking. I'll have quite long hook lengths because I'm not sure what's out there. And as long as I get a drop, I'll leave it. So two casts per rod. Bump got a bit of a drop. It was all slow sinking, you know, it'd go down the stiff section of the hook length and then it would drop like that. And um just scattered a load of baits over it. I think I had three or four fish that day. Um Jeez. you know, out of there. And you know, talking about the Lynch Hill complex, you know, I fished quite a bit on, on Christchurch as well. And that rig really did pay dividends on there because Christchurch is a perfect water for that sort of rig. It's a it's a pressured water. Yeah, very pressured. Lots of lads fish it, you know, the fish know they're being fished for all the time these spots in every peg where everyone says that's where you fish so they're the waters i love to fish you know i I just think right well because at the time you know i'm confident they've not seen my rig or they might have seen the stiff hinge or but they've not seen anything like mine so when i first went on um on the on christchurch you know i used it on there did not been a fish caught on a boilie for for about three or four weeks, the maggots, because they use maggots on there, you know, mm. later on in the year, you get a bit of a maggot time and loads of fish get caught on maggots and you struggle on boilies. My first session on there, it, it was maggot time and I didn't know, so obviously I've turned up. I had four fish on my rig, that you know, no. on, my, on my rig. And I'm just convinced that, again, the, the fish are visiting the area. They've got no caution. They're completely confident. They'll come and feed. You know, they pick my rig up and, and, and it's a case of, you know, oh my God, what's going on here? This is this is different. And it is so different. Even when you look at it, it's stark. But like, it is just such a different presentation. Overall, you've got a you've got a pop up that you can adjust. Brilliant. But the mechanics of it, like you say, are so different. Talk to me about the coated hook length that you come up to the the either hook. Is it just put on with a normal knotless knot, or is it knotted on? How is it, how is the coated hook length attached to the hook? To the hook. Yeah. It's just um. It's just basically a knotless, uh, just a knotless knot type knot that eventually comes back, just comes back through, through the eye. Just a basic knotless knot. So that it, it traps the, it traps the stiff section along the back of the hook. Yeah, yeah. It's just, just. A so basic. you just whip over the stiff section. Just whip over it. Whip over the the shank of the hook. The stiff section is lay, lay along parallel with it, and I just whip the whole thing on. And then how do you join the stiff section lower down on the hook level? Now the joining of the stiff section lower down, it all re, it all returns back, and obviously you decide how long you want to have it. Yeah. And it's literally all I do is I, I line them both up parallel with each other, loop it over, and then just go go through it four times. With this rig, you have got to use a minimum of twenty pound hook length because of that knot. Yeah, it's a weak point. It's isn't a it? weak point. Yeah, you know, or or it can be a weak point. It's not a weak point at twenty or twenty five pound okay. breaking strain. I have never, never had a hook had a, a hook length go at that point. Um, you know. As I say, we get back to the confidence of the fish. You don't need to use a fine, a fine hook length. They'll, yeah. they'll suck anything, and you can use a third. You can use 
lead, make it out of lead core and they would probably, <laughs> they'd probably still suck it in. You know, right. so, you know, so yeah, that's never been an issue. It's always been, it's always been fine. And, you know, over the years, you know, some lads, you know, I have had messages off, off lads on social media and, and, and comments where people are saying, totally overthinking it. You know, it's it, it's not needed. This is ridiculous. I've said this to you about this rig. Yeah, yeah, I've had comments like that, you know, when it's been when it's been out there in the past. And look, I'm not trying to pretend that this is the ultimate carp rig or anything like that. You know, it's something that I have developed. It's something that I've got ultimate confidence in. It's something I believe in. Um, but, you know, if somebody don't believe in it, you know, you get lads saying, you know, that what a load of rubbish every time a fish sucks, sucks a bait in, then, you know, y- you catch it. And I'm, my answer to that is, well, how can you say that? Because we've been watching carp fishing underwater mm. videos for the last 10 years and we can all see fish doing exactly that. 100%. You know, and, you know, if it wasn't for, you know, you've got the likes of um, Kevin Maddox, you know, if it wasn't for anglers that that think outside the box, you know, um, what springs to mind is um, Martin Clark's book. I don't know if you've seen yeah, that back yeah, in the yeah. day. He had some really... Out of the box rigs in there. Uh, one was called the Scorpion. One was called the Snake. Yeah, you know, crazy rigs. But I love it. I love that sort of thing because without blokes thinking like that, then we wouldn't we wouldn't have the area now. We there's uh, have developments I, exactly, and I think there's very few people. And fair play to you. There's very few people nowadays that would that would sort of put it out there to even try things like that. If you're catching. It's sort of oblivious, ignorance is bliss with regards to how many pickups to sort of how many they're landing. There wouldn't be that thought process, but because you've come from, I think, that formative time where the hair rigs kicked in and you've seen sort of that in your own angling, I think there is that sort of thirst and search for that. And and this rig, there's no doubt about it, mate. Whether you think it, anybody else, it's all about confidence. And for you, you can see in your catch rates and what you catch here, there and everywhere that if I was you, I'd be using that rig everywhere I possibly could as well, mate, because you go by your own results, don't you, mate? And you've, you've, you're you've not short of a bite or two. No, no. I mean, confidence is everything in carp fishing. Yeah. You know, it's, um, you know, whether it's rig, bait, or any sort of method, you know, confidence is everything. And I have got, you know, the utmost confidence in that rig now. You know, there's a few lads on here that have started to use it. You know, they started to tie it up themselves, which, you know, fair play, you know, uh, for quite a few years, I didn't really want to speak about it, but you know, as you get a bit older, you learn a bit more, and you start thinking, you know, ca- keeping keeping secrets. It's not it's not the eighties anymore. You know, keeping secrets doesn't really catch any more fish. And you know, if I can if I can help someone to put a couple of fish on the bank, you know, to develop a rig or think think a bit differently, even if they don't make my rig up, even if they just start thinking differently. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, then great. You know, it's what he's saying is he's got another rig that's like version two that he's not going to tell us about. But I'll let you off, mate. That's oh, good. Well, we'll that's play. good. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to go back to sort of we talked about the end of the wire chapter. But what I wanted to come back to is Elstow. So obviously we moved from Elstow. You talked about catching the mother epic. Did you catch the twin as well? No, no. The twin evaded you. The, the twin evaded me. I watched. I watched both my friends catch it. I watched them. Um, J- Jamie Closet catch it. Yeah, Jay talks about um, it. You know, because uh, I became quite friendly with Jamie I mean when I was at Wireside um, just shortly after I left Wireside Jamie Jamie Klossick he, he started fishing Wireside and a couple of my mates were still fishing up there mm. and um, one of my mates Jason he, he he had a really good capture on there one day and we went up there to photograph the fish I always said to him if you catch if you catch the big lin um, wherever I am I'll come and photograph it for you so he, he, he gave us the call one night and we went up there photographed it and that's where I met Jamie for the first time yeah and straight away straight away you know he was Super enthusiastic, um, as we all were at that time, and 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 and, and we hit it off, and um, you know that started probably a thirty-year friendship with Jamie, and since then we've fished literally many places. You know what I mean? O- over the years, and um, you know it was me that told Jamie about the deer park. Yeah, know, Titan, it was me that told Jamie about. He told me about your experience on there, mate. About yeah. that night and the yeah. the, the finger, mate. Oh, and the yeah, rest yeah, of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. a bit of you, no. <laughs> no, no. So yeah, you know, I, Jamie would obviously. I, you know, I'm from Cheshire, and he was like, right, well, you know, he'd kind of done Wireside, mm. and you know, where should I go now? And you know, I told him about um, Colmere at first. You know, yeah, there's, well, there's this place that's got a lot of mystery about it, Colmere. And eventually, um, you know, onto onto the deer park, and, and and we started fishing both them places together 
but this was a period of my life when um i don't know if you know but um uh, you know i was having children for the first time and one of my little girls was yeah. poorly yeah, she eventually yeah. ended up passing away she had um Brilliant. you know she caught leukemia <sighs> and just at the time when my fishing was jamie with, with jamie was we had all these plans for for colmere and um tatton park just at that time um i had to deal with with obviously my daughter and hospital mm, visits and God, living man. in that hospital for for many years so <sighs> jamie Jamie would carried on and did what we planned and um yeah, was super successful. But that's a story for Jamie to tell. <laughs> Jeez, mate. Like it's amazing, isn't it? Like I think you, you go through fishing and you so, you meet such like minded people, but then there's that fishing life and then sometimes, as you say, there's things in life that sort of override things at times. And that is a is an inc- well, it's a, it's a difficult chapter and I can't even imagine it, mate. But for yeah, place, you know, yeah. it's um you know, fishing was really all uh, that I was interested in, uh, you know, at the time, and then you know, you meet, you meet your partner, you know, mm-hmm. you get married, you start having children, and then you know, obviously kids come before anything. Your family life becomes before before anything, and you know, life's ticking along great, everything's superb, and then you get, you know, you get the the news that, and then you you know, fishing took a back seat. I mean, I did still fish. It did really. You know, getting back to the Elstow Pit One, I did eventually get a Pit One ticket and caught quite a few fish. Right. But this was during that same period, so yeah. all the plans that I had, you know, for fishing my rotors down at Pit One, you know, they went out the window, and fishing was more. You know, it was a couple of times a year. You know, when 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 my daughter was well, mm. that you thought you could get out, and so yeah, so it did really restrict the 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 Pit One journey that I'd planned for many years. That was. You know, that was kind of put a back seat. And to be honest, I never really got to grips with Pit One, even though I caught quite a few fish, you know, fished it a few times, caught quite a few fish, you know, up to up to late 30. But that really restricted Pit One for me. Circumstances are difficult there. Yeah. But do you think that that, in a way, that whole sequence of events, that, that difficult chapter, do you think that reinvigorated you fishing-wise? Because I imagine you fished, you fished hard here, mate. There's no two ways about it. Like work life is not really there like you'll go out doing it as much as you possibly can because you love it but there becomes a point and i reference rob gillespie and a few other lads that have been on the podcast where there's a tipping point where it's almost you go one way or another you go more into it and you find a different avenue or you sort of sh- go away from it because you almost burn out uh, were you, did you feel like you were getting to that point did the whole sequence of events make mean that after this time and everything that had gone on that you sort of had more emphasis and more keenness to get at it yeah, I think I think if it if 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 it wouldn't have happened, mm. then quite possibly I, I I might have been on the on the road to burnout. You know, yeah. I was doing that much of it, but obviously because the fishing was was taken away from me, um, and then we had to deal with the family sort of thing for 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 many years. Eventually, once that was sorted and and the time became available to come to get back into my fishing again, I was reinvigorated. It was like you know yeah. I was just want to get I want to get back into it now, and. It was like everything had a different light on it. I mean, it does. You, you know, you speak to people who have, you know, they, they have illnesses and they recover and when they have recovered or they have something happened to them, they look at things differently. And, and, you know, now, no matter how hard a lake might be, no matter how long it takes to, to get for... It's, it, 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 even though people think... A lot of people think fishing is my life. And I think when I was in my, my teens and 20s, it probably was. Yeah. But after after coming through that experience... Um, that family experience, which, I mean, to be honest, just to touch on that briefly, you know, we spent many years in hospital and mm. we got quite friendly with a lot of couples that were going through the same sort of journey at the time. And years later, I would probably say eight or nine out of 10 of them couples, it, they broke up within three or five yeah. years of yeah, yeah. of finishing the journey. And it was the opposite for me, for, for me and my wife, Julie. You know, it, it kind of made us stronger, even though the outcome was not what we wanted. No. Um, it, it it made us stronger. It was really weird. It, it, I, I said I said it a few times that it made us feel, made me feel like we had some sort of force field around us. Yeah, we was we was protected. It, it made us so strong. So when I came back to my fishing, I wasn't as obsessed, and because I wasn't as obsessed, I found it easier. It was really strange, you know. Blanking was didn't didn't bother me. It was like, well, you know, look at the problems you could have in the world. Look look at yeah, look, look at yeah, where yeah. you could be. You know, you you're out fishing, catching or not. You're out fishing, just enjoy it. So I came back to fishing with this with this new outlook, and yeah, I, I've enjoyed it 
a lot more since, I think. I think it's for, it's a fortunate perspective to have. You can get lost in it. You can get lost in anything, but especially this. It's a lot of time. It can really take over a lot of your, your sort of spare time. But if something happens like, okay, that is an extreme example, and I don't know how you've come through it because I couldn't even imagine it. But if something happens like that, it does all of a sudden you think, and that different perspective, as you say, like you might not necessarily feel like you want it as more, but I think you fish better sometimes with that sort of relaxed. You don't overfish it. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I see it so many times on, on, on lakes um, these days. And, and there's a couple of anglers that fish Grenville that, that, that are, they, they're overthinking it. You know, mm. they're forever stood on the front of the platform and looking, oh, the, the fish are showing there. And why have I not had a bite? And I should have had a bite. And do we need to reach? And, you know, I'll often say, look, just relax. You know, the the fish are out there. You're in a good spot. You know, just let it all, just let it happen. And, and, and it will happen. Crazy, mate. Another question with regards to choice of venue. So obviously we talked about Elgstay. We talked about you moving up to Wire. Why not Yately? Mate. Well, Yately was a near miss for me. You know, back in them days, before I went to, to Darrenth, you know, obviously when I was thinking of travelling down south, mm. you know, it was it was it was the Car Park Lake you know, or Darrenth. It was it was one or the other. I think I think Yately might have been a leisure sport water at the time. Mm. Um and uh, to be honest, I don't know. And I do regret the fact that I never went to Yately, the Car Park Lake and and you know fish for basil and heather and all them I- iconic fish because it was a bit of me that's that style of fish and i know jamie went there you know he fished caught down single, there yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and caught caught some 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 mega fish and i don't know i think it was one or the other i ended up going to going to darren and then i came back to the northwest and then when it became traveling again waters like like st ives had, 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 had come on the radar then and by that how, time. how did you get to hear about that? Because that's in, uh, when I think of St Ives, I do definitely think of you, you, you and your captures. What, yeah, how did I you think, get onto that? I think I, I think we say Ives. It was just again. It was just the the you know the magazines, the weeklies. Right. By that time, I was fishing quite a bit with Jamie. You know, we'd 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 done. I'd sort of done pit two before Jamie, and then he'd come, and he he, he fished it and was mega successful. Um, and then we just 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 talking amongst ourselves, you know, the fat lady was being spoke about. It was a massive fish at the time, um, by many anglers across the country, and um, yeah, we just decided, you know, let, let's let, let's fish together. This is probably the first lake we fished from the start together with. Um, we got ourselves St. Irish tickets and um, attempted to try and catch the fat fat lady. Another another super low stock water at the time. Yeah, talk to me about the actual stock and the composition of that lake. Well, I think, um, well, you had the two lakes. You had the old lake and the new lake. I think the lake is probably about 55, 60 acres, two islands on there. Um, as I say, the islands do separate the old and new lakes. Very low stock. Um, again, it was one of them waters where where location was everything. But obviously, having fished Pit 2, mm. we were kind of pretty sharp on location, you know. Um, Jamie was really good at spotting fish. You know, I was equally as good. And um, yeah, we just we we just fished it. We didn't even didn't even concentrate on catching fish at first. My main sort of goal was just seeing him, just 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 getting on him. I thought if I can just get on him, then there'll probably be a chance. So yeah, all about location. And um, again, you know, I did quite well. I think my first bite ever on that lake was the, was the mother. I mean, it was um, the lady. It was the lady, lady, your first bite? First bite. How long did that take to come? I think it was probably second or third session. Are you taking the mickey? Yeah. Second or third How third long's session. your session? <laughs> Half a year? That's ridiculous. <laughs> That's three or four nights. Um, second or third session in, in, in a peg called The Works, where the lady was known to frequent. And um, I got this bite one day and, you know, ended up playing this fish. It was clear from the off. It was it was a massive. It was a real heavy fish. And there was only two real heavy fish in there. Mm. At the time, you had, you had the lady and you had the, the black pig. Um, the pig. Yeah, the pig, yeah. <laughs> Proper character fish. And um, yeah, I played this fish, hooked it in the middle of the afternoon. It held its ground at long range, like they do. And then um, took me 15 minutes to get sort of like within 10, 15 yards of the bank and then the hook pulled. Um <sighs> The pig came out about three days later, so it wasn't it wasn't the pig, and I was I mean you can never be hundred percent, but I'd bet money it was the it was the lady, um, 
I caught quite a few fish after that, you know, in the couple of seasons that I fished it since. Um, caught the pig, you know. Yeah? Um, yeah, caught the pig. That was quite a good um, good headline in the in the cart sort of that because that was <laughs> bacon catches the pig. <laughs> yeah. yeah, quality. So, um, how big was the pig? I, uh, that was um, it was low forty at the time when I caught oh, it. That's a big one, isn't it? Yeah, um, great capture. But again, that was the capture of that fish was all down to again just listening at night. That that, that did teach me the importance of sometimes they won't show during the day. You've got to listen at night, which I went for about a season of doing that and. Managed to track down the pig. Was showing after dark, October, November. It was showing after dark um, in a certain part of the lake. This corner, um, a big fish was anyway. And uh, you know, I decided to fish to fish that corner. And the first bite out of there was the pig. Um, and then obviously Jamie was fishing at the same time. Jamie, yeah. Jamie caught the fat lady. You know, I, I landed the fat lady for him. That was a brilliant moment. You know, um, Jamie's story again to tell, but at a huge weight. So yeah. Um, that was my my um, St. Ives, eight St. Ives chapter done. Done? No, no lady? Never caught the lady. It died, unfortunately. You know, oh, Jamie, did it? Yeah, Jamie okay. caught after, it. And then after? Jamie caught it and you know, I think it was. I think it had a couple of more captures in it and then it, and then it passed away. So. But you stayed on after Jamie had done, did you? I stayed on for a couple of sessions, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, um, but once, it was a place together that you both... Yeah, yeah. So I, I ended up pulling off there. And um, I think I went back to... I think at the time I went... I did a short a short time on Manor Farm Essex um, right. for one season. Caught a fair few fish out of there. I bet you did. Yeah. Isn't That's a bit of a contrast, yeah, mate, isn't it? that was all right. Of yeah, venues. Fish there. Caught quite a few fish on the adjustable zigs there. That was the, the first time I'd ever used adjustable zigs. Right. But I say only lasted one season on there because the drive was the drive was too much. It was that far from Manchester. And, you know, sometimes I'd travel for four, five, six hours to arrive at the lake, car park full of cars, very limited option as far as pegs would go. And, I decided, look, I'm going to have to start trying to find somewhere a little bit closer to home. So I went back to the, the Saint, um, to the Lynch Hill complex and fished Christchurch for, for a few years before, and that was then before I came here. What did you have out? Did you fish stonies as well? Did you, mate? I fished stonies, yeah. Again, um, only for a couple of seasons. Um, that was obviously, as you know, stonies is boat work. Yeah, was this at the time where you dropping rigs or were you casting? Um, at the time, we was we was I think it was it was on the changeover. It was oh, casting okay. at first. And then the, the dropping was allowed. Um, so, yeah, I just went through the motions of doing that, you know, using my rig again, catching fish. Um, again, it was very busy on there. Mm. You know, it was it, it was really busy. And the busyness factor was what really, uh, I couldn't get my head around it. So I moved quite quickly over to, over to Christchurch. And, you know, it was great on there. I loved it on there. It was all quite intimate, quite close fishing. Again, tricky fish. Pressured, isn't Pressured it? Pressured fishing. Yeah. You know, um, lasted there for a while, but again, I didn't seem to last that long there because the busyness factor. You know, it's um, why is that? Is that a frustration point? If you see something, you can't move on to it. That sort of thing, or yeah, I think it is that. Uh, you know, it's probably. I think in the earlier days, I was prepared to put up with that busyness factor because you know you're young and you're, you're super keen, and you know you sort of like you're prepared to put up with anything. You know, but uh, as I've got older, you know, we spanned quite a few years there. You know during my fishing career and mm. I started to get the attitude that, you know, I can't really be bothered now. You know, it's, it's a bit of a, that was then, you know, it's come back now. Cause in recent, you know, in the last couple of years I've joined, I've joined Kingsmead and Horton. Yeah. And they're just as busy, but for some reason I'm up for it now. You know, you know, I've, yeah. I've fished Grenville for, for, for four, five, six years, you know, it doesn't get that busy, you know, and I've been quite successful and it, it, the style of fishing that we've got here, um, it's completely different fishing to them, to the to to the the K ones where it's observations, looking, moving. Mm. You know, you might fish three or five different spots during the course of a three day session. Um, I don't know, but just just in in the last in the last sort of two years, I've I've, I've found myself thinking, you know what, I'm, I want to still see if I can do that style of fishing. Yeah, that's good though. I like that. I think that's healthy. Like yeah. it's phases, isn't it? It's where you are at the right time and what feels right and what you want to do, which is good. And you are very varied, mate. Throughout the course of it all, you've got real big fish sort of i mean i know it's not necessarily been target fishing all about that fish it's been bites but you've been on some rock hard venues the manor farm like you've been on a venue where you're going to get bites and test you there's always a constant sort of i don't know if it's a want for a challenge but there's a new challenge all the time isn't there it's not like do you know what i mean i know you've done a bit of time on here and we're going to come on to talk about here but there's always been a different type of challenge that you've taken on isn't there 
Yeah, well, I mean, what's the saying? Variety, yeah, the spice of life. Enough. You know, people say to me, you know, you, you, you know, you fish Grenville. You've had you've had quite a lot of, of big fish, and where are you going to move to now? And it's not all about for me. It's not about trying to catch a bigger fish, trying to increase y- y- your PB. As I say, it's all about the the problem solving thing for me. I, mm. You know, whether I go to a lake in in Manchester, and the biggest the biggest fish in there is thirty one pound, but it's really hard to catch, but it gets seen a lot. Then that's another problem that that can get me going. You know, I get I'm, I'm up for that. Let me see if I can figure it out. You know, how, how can I catch it? So different venues hold different different puzzles to to solve, and I'm up for solving any of them it's not it's not just about you know obviously we need big fish you know you need everyone likes to yeah yeah to be there point. but yeah. just to be consistent on different types of venues is, is is what i'm into lynch christchurch stonies captures choco no 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 i didn't catch any of the of the known big ones right. out of, okay. of stone um yeah. you know i think i caught fish up to mid to late 30 out there you know commons mirrors nice. um you know, I caught. I did all right for my actual rod hours spent on the lake, but there yeah. wasn't many rod hours. Um, a few more rod hours I spent on Christchurch. You know, again, Christchurch is one of them waters where you can climb trees, mm. you can see your rig, you can see fish's reactions to baited areas. Loved it, absolutely loved it because, again, you know, I've come to Christchurch with the the new improved version of of, of my rig. You know, I fished it three or four years ago now, and. Um, you know, putting that rig in the edge and watching the fish respond to it and, and, and seeing how efficient it was just ticked all the boxes and it was really effective, super effective, you know, even casting it out into the pond. You know, I was sure that, again, the hooking to sucking ratio of, of the rig I was using was quite low. So if the fish were as confident and as blase as I thought they were, which I do believe, then they were, they were going to keep trying it. And as long as they keep, as long as they try it, they were going to get caught out. So you've never, in all these observations of different venues, you've never seen fish come in with like caution with regards to lines, with regards to anything like that. You've always seen them quite straight in, straight down on a spot. And it's just the, the mechanics of a rig that's sort of been the, the differentiation between bite and no bite. Yeah, I would say, gen- I mean, I'm talking generally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, of course, there are, there are certain fish, you know, certain lakes where, <clears throat> you know, fish uh, approach an area, you know, super cautiously you know we all know um and we can think of fish across the country that are massive but get caught very rarely you know um what is it called the spitfire common for instance yeah, yeah, it's been, oh, yeah. you know get seen on a regular basis <clears throat> get seen on a regular basis in the edge feeding on feeding on anglers baits yeah, there's the get, wood and the long in there they're both they're yeah, both infrequent visitors yeah, for the amount of anglers really um you know Free, you know, rare visitors to the bank. Mm. I would, I would love to have a go for them. You know, I'd love to to I'd love to, to see that. Mate. I'd love to have a go for them. And you know, I, I've I've spoke to you know to Rich who, who who runs it. Um, you know, through text and stuff. And he, he said, you know, if any opportunities come in, let me know. But yeah, I'm dying for them sort of opportunities. And um, you know, I mean, again, getting back to you know, really, really cute, cautious fish. You know, as, as you know, I spent a bit of time on on, on Nash Cops Lake. Yeah. And again, you know, wow. What a lake that is, without doubt. You said it's the hardest place you've ever fished. It is without doubt the hardest lake I've ever fished, without doubt. It's the smallest lake I've ever fished. Yeah, and it's also the hardest. Lake. I mean, them fish. Before we got access to that lake, me and Jamie, we were fishing Nash Church Lake. Yeah, and um, you know, it, it was it was often. You know, the cops would not be fished over the weekend. You'd be on the Church Lake. You could hear the fish in the Cops Lake, which is just at the back. You could hear them boshing out. You know, for fun all weekend and then as soon as a set of anglers that were paying to fish you know two or three anglers would fish it Monday to Friday as soon as they pushed the wheelbarrows on on the Monday morning it was like the fish had been took out of the lake them fish were by far the hardest fish I've ever, I've ever tried. Which is funny because a lot of the times especially historically in that media they've been discredited as like garden pond fish haven't they? Go and try and catch it. <laughs> Go and try and catch but it. But when you fished it with Jamie you wouldn't the process of getting on there, how did you get on there? And also, the stock at the time that you got on there, is this before the fish kills and all the movement? Is, like, is that all, they all in there, the big ones? Well, there was a lot of big ones in there when we, I mean, obviously, like I say, um, I, 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 I was connected with, with, Kevin asked me to join the company yeah. um, for the for the, for the the few years. <clears throat> and I took the opportunity up. And he it was then that he said to me and Jamie that the Cops Lake, which was a mega lake, I, I don't even know how many, I think it was Five, six, seven fifties, yeah, a sixty in it, you know, an sixty, up, yeah, I upper 60, fifty yeah. common. 
at one stage. Um, Kevin wasn't quite happy with the with the lake itself. There was a few areas of the lake where they were starting to silt up. They were starting to smell a bit a bit a bit wrong, mm. and. He wanted the fish out, basically. He wanted to get the fish out. He wanted to drain the lake and move the fish on and restock restock the new lake. So, But he didn't want, want to net the fish. So he said to me and Jamie, look, I'm going to close the lake. If you and Jamie want to fish it, you can fish it together, but you must fish it week in, week out because I want these fish caught. Um, anything you catch, you'll move. So we fished it. We fished it on our first session together, and that first session told us everything we need to know. It, it couldn't take two anglers. If there was two anglers yeah. on the lake, there was too much disturbance, too much movement. The fish would completely got onto you and the fish, the fish would just go and hide away and you, and you wouldn't even see a show. So after the first session, we decided to do a week on, week off each, or alternate the weeks, Monday to Friday. And yeah, um, super hard spot fishing. My rig I used, you know, caught quite a few. But the main thing, uh, this is an example of how hard that lake was to catch fish. You know, one session... I said to Kevin, we caught a few fish, and I said to Kevin, has anybody ever used zigs on here? He said, well, you know, the odd person has tried the odd zig, but no one's really fished it, um, you know, properly, gone full in on him. So for the last 24 hours of this particular session, I decided to use a zig, but I used a zig in one of the channels. There was six foot of water, probably about two, three foot of weed, light weed. So I used a zig in the weed, one ounce leg, lead. So it was popped up above the weed by about two foot with about a foot of water above it before the surface. And I caught three fish on me last night. Right. So, But these fish I caught were commons. And they were all probably 13 to 25 pound. Now, if you know that lake, Kevin's never stocked anything nah, small in grinds, there. Yeah. And anything that gets caught small gets removed. Always. Yep. So these fish had been bred from egg. They grew to 15 to 25 pound. They'd never picked a hook bait up, That's never been mad. caught because they would have been removed. We'd not caught them, me and Jamie, but because I'd used a completely different technique, i.e. zigs over weed, I think the next session I went on there, I went all in on that on that method. I had 13 carp up to 28 pound. That's crazy. All these fish had been spawned from egg, never been caught. So the point I'm making is, how can a fish be spawned from egg in a lake that's what an acre They're in size? Caught not get caught for all these years and what I've used and a method did not been not had an opportunity to have before and caught them. So amazing. That lake honestly blew my mind. You know, just the way the fish would get away with it, how hard they were to catch. I mean obviously eventually we caught all the fish. Eventually I caught I and I, I caught the big common, you know, fifty The Emperor. Yeah. Was the the wood carving. Oh the wood carving. The wood carving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was um it was the last fish I ever caught out there. You know, we we'd fished through one spring, I caught quite a few fish. And the funny thing was with that fish, the very first day I saw it, after the winter and spring, we never saw it at all. It was it was like it wasn't there. But the very first day I saw it, it was basking in the sun and four hours later I actually caught it. So the first day it sort of shown itself and was getting about the pond. What? I actually hooked it and caught it. Crazy. Yeah. That's my mate. biggest comment today, that fifty seven. So. Yeah, that's an incredible fish, mate. Incredible. Mm. Yeah. The cops like it's back open, mate. You'd have to get back on yeah. there. Different fish. Yeah. But you'd have to get back on there, mate. <laughs> Talk to me about this place. We are at it is just a cop fishing mecca. It's probably the I think somebody's described it to me as the most perfect cop like it might have even been you. And I'm with you, mate, because from what we've seen and we've probably been here. Four or five hours maximum, and I've been fortunate enough to have a buy. It is some incredible place. Like, it's ridiculous, isn't it? How did you get on to here? Obviously, you said you've been looking at it in terms of you've seen the fish and the growth rates and stuff, but actually getting on to here at a time, you is it five, six years you've done on it? Yeah, yeah. Just, um, the, the, the season coming will be my sixth season on here. So, um, and obviously the previous four, you know, the first four years, uh, I wasn't looking at any anywhere else to fish. It was just Grenville on my mind. But <clears throat> the way I got onto it was, um, I think I was fishing Christchurch at the time, Lynch Hill. Um, busy place, really busy. But obviously, I mean, anybody, you know, during them years, you only had to pick the carp talk up to see, you know, there was Grenville was, was, was starting mm. to be reported in the carp talk 30s. You know, there was a lot of 30s being caught. You know, so you've seen Matt's Cottage with, with, with loads of carp out of here. And, um, you know, I wanted to fish the lake. So, you know, made a few inquiries, eventually got Paul's number, contacted Paul. Um, strong rumours going around about the owner of Grenville, you know, how 
oh, you don't want to face that lake. It, 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 it's, it, there's trouble on there. The owner's not nice. Yeah, I remember this. You'll never get on the lake. It, it's dead man's shoes. It's invite only. All these rumours. But I thought, well, you know, if you don't ask, you don't get. So I contacted Paul and he got back to me and said, you know, he invited me around um, down for an informal interview. Basically, you know, you come down, you have a walk around the lake. During the course of that walk, Paul will chat to you. You know, where have you fished? But, you know, just, just general chit chat. Obviously, he, you know, he's sussing you out. And at the end of that walk, if you know, if, if he thinks that you might be suitable to go on the waiting list, then he'll offer you a place on the waiting list. And um, that's exactly what happened, you know. Um, I think at the minute, if you're on the waiting list, you know, you can do the odd guest session on the lake. Yeah. The time that I was on the waiting list, that, that wasn't in operation. So it was basically, you go on the waiting list, you wait for your name to come to the top or wait for an offer, and then you take it up. Um the reason I chose it, obviously, loads of big fish at the time, but you know, I wanted I wanted somewhere where the possibility of 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 runs, basically, you know, of multiple captures, you know, if you yeah. get it right, you know, and I, I could see what was happening on Grenville. It seemed to tick all the boxes. So yeah, came here first season, you know, caught a few fish. You know, it's a bit of a steep learning curve. You know, I've not I'd, I'd never fished at range before. Yeah, yeah. You know, Grenville was known as a range water and, and there's no doubt at t- certain times of the year it is a range water. You know, the fish do migrate into the centre area of the lake what you know, you can't reach. Um, but I'd say most, you know, I'd say, you know, the warmer months, I mean, we're not fishing range now, you know, t- 25 to 30 rats. That's range for me, boy. Yeah, it might be <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, you know, that was the start of, of the Grenville journey and I've not got anything but amazing things to say about this lake. You know, we just spoke about some of the other waters that I've fished over the years. This is, I think this is the most perfect carp environment in this country. You know, the fish thrive, large volume of water, depths down to 40 foot. Yeah. You know, undertow, windswept, naturals, you know, the carp just, just, just thrive. And when I first joined, you know, it was mainly about thirties and, you know, thirties with, with, with forties. But since then, you know, they've pushed right through and there's as many 40s now as there was 30s when I joined six years ago, you know, and the fish just get bigger and bigger every year. It's incredible. Like when you see a lot of fisheries sort of seem to hit a plateau with fish sizes at a certain point, and don't get me wrong, they're big fish here at the moment doesn't seem to have hit a plateau. It's an incredible story in itself. And I'm going to try and get Paul. He's been very kind to let me on. So thank you, Paul. I'm going to try and get Paul on his own podcast to talk about it all. Because there is lots of speculation and rumour about the fish. Also him, the rules and stuff like that. And I don't, having spoke to him and met him very briefly, he's an absolute down-to-earth top bloke. He's had loads of people on there like that he's let on to do media projects and stuff. He's very, very sort of reasonable more so than i thought he would be listening to what people have spoke about with regards to him in the past he's an absolute top lad and what a fishery he's created so fair play paul i'm going to get him on and talk more about that with the fish doc but for you coming on here in that first year you said you caught a few how did you find the adjustment to range fishing did you find that easy hard was it an updating tackle that it needed was it an updating technique how did you get about all that because that is probably on here the sort of the starkest difference is that range work on a big pit where you do get big winds and you get conditions that come in that can affect all that as well. Yeah. Well, I've always, even though I've never really, I've never really fished a water full time that is an out and out long distance casting water. You know, I have frequented places like A1 pits over the years. You know, me and my mates, we used to like to go over there every now and then, fish on pit six. And again, pit, pit, pit six, which a bit of a range water really, you know, if you can fish far into the wind, you know, you've got a good chance of getting some bites in there. So I was always okay at fishing, you know, up to sort of 120, 130. So, but when I came to Grenville, you know, obviously straight away I'm thinking about, you know, uh, I need after the first season, you know, I caught, caught quite a few fish at normal to, to sort of like my long range at the time, which was 120, 130. But then I could see all the lads, you know, there was, there was lads on there that had been members for a few years unbelievable casters I mean Carl Pitcher fishes it for instance and oh yeah you watch him cast and it's like how can how can a man cast that far he's a unit isn't yeah well? exactly unbelievable so straight away you know I knew that I had to I had to practice I had to maybe change my rods so you know I bought some distance rods you know when you back in them days 
if you thought about long distance fishing, free spirit was the first sort of name that people was looking at for, mm. for casting far. So, you know, bought them rods since then have changed and just developed and, and tried to, you know, practice. You, you cannot be, the amount of people that say to me, oh, you know, I keep practicing, you know, when I'm fishing, I'll, I'll, I'll go into the next peg and cast. But it's not good enough. You've, you've really got to, when you're at home, you've got to go on a field and you've got to cast and cast and cast. I've never took any tuitions, you know, and I do think I benefit now from tuitions because I think I've gone as far as I can go yeah. without being criticised by somebody who knows, can look and say, look, you're doing really well, mate, but if you do this and this, you're going to get that. So that's what I'm going to think about in the future. But just by the general fishing it for as long as I have, you know, my casting has, has probably gone from from 140, you know, to from sort of 30, 30, 35 wraps, you know, up to 40 wraps sort of thing. So you just think you increase it just by trial and error, repetitiveness, just doing it and doing it again. The angling on here, the sort of memorable sessions you've had, you caught a lot of 40 pounders, you caught a 60 this year and everything in between, mate. The... The sort of significant chapters for you. What are those moments when you when you think about Grenville, where you you sort of hark back to first in your head? Well, there's no doubt. Um, there's no doubt. There's a couple of sessions that you know stand out in my mind, and not really for catching a big fish. You know, right. I came to Grenville for hits, for the possibility of catching a lot of fish, and I think it was the end of my first season. Um, I was, you know, I was I was fishing for the last three or four days of the season, and I was fishing just around the corner actually in Peg Thirty Three, and there was a chap fishing in Peg Six, which goes out to the side of the island, and yeah. um, this chap caught, I think he had thirty five carp in the last four days of the season, really well. Wow! You know, it was every every single time I looked over that way, he was playing a fish or photographing a fish. I was in peg 33, you know, caught, caught a couple of fish as, as the rest of the lake did, but he was clearly having it off in this peg and the fish were on the island. So that was it. I made a mental note there and then I thought next year, same time, I want to be on the side of the island. So it's quite funny actually because I realised at the time that, you know, um, I needed a van because I was fishing out of a car at the time and the rules have changed since, but back in them days, you could park on, on the lane that, that leads down to the lake you could park on that lane um, any time of the night um, and you couldn't, the gates, you, could, you couldn't come onto the site until seven o'clock at night. And one thing I've never been able to do during my fishing career is I've never been able to drive through the night. I've never been able to wake up at one o'clock and drive to a lake. For some yeah. reason, my body clock, I just, I just struggle. Like Jamie, for instance. Yeah. He can leave Blackpool at midnight and drive to bloody Lake Bled and not sleep. He just, he just does it, but I couldn't do it and, during the course of my first year on here, I was almost falling asleep on the road. And, oh, it's sketchy. And I just thought, you know what? I'm going to be fishing this lake for, for that much longer. It's like playing a game of Russian roulette. Sooner or later, I'm, I am going to fall asleep and I'm probably going to have an accident. So I thought, well, how can I get around that? I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll buy myself a van. I'll buy myself a transporter. So I got myself a transporter. And I used to, the next year, when I wanted to get in that in that, in that that peg for the last sort of few days of the season, I'd maybe mind up. Get yourself a van. You can get on the lane at midnight. Um, I can jump straight in the back of the van. Bed's already made for what I've done at home. Sleep and, you know, first in the queue. We've got first option. and So I did that for a couple of seasons. Um, the rules have changed now, actually. You can't actually do that anymore. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if that's because of me. That's, <laughs> yeah, the bacon rule, yeah. <laughs> the claws. Um, so, yeah, so the next year, last last session of the, of, of the year, you know, I was first in the queue. I had first choice, obviously, straight into peg six. Um I'd been thinking about this session all year, you know, the way I was going to attack it. And uh, I knew at that stage I was going to use a lot of bait. You know, during the course of the season before, I'd started to use more and more bait. Mm -hmm. I'm in a really fortunate situation. I'm, obviously, I'm connected to DNA and they have been for many years. You know, you know I'm on a, I'm on a really good bait dealer. Then I get, I get bait off them, you know, for nothing really, as yeah. long as I don't take too much of it. So during the course of that year, I was holding bait back. I, you know, got a couple of chest freezers at home. And I started to stockpile bait. I thought, when I do this end of the season session, if I get in that peg, I'm going to use a lot of bait. So we had about 80 key for this session. So I managed to get in the peg, um, put 20, 30 key out straight away. The fish did not visit me for 24 hours. I actually, the first five fish I actually caught from the margins of that peg. I mean, the fish along along that bank now quite close. And I caught five fish 
Um, I put 30k out, caught Oof. five fish in the margins. And then the second morning I woke up, as soon as I looked out to the area where I'd put the bait the day before, the fish were, were coming up on it. I knew they were there. So that was it. That was the start of it. I reached up my rods out there. And um, yeah, to cut a long story short, I had a, I think I had about 65 bites in the last... Jesus. In the last um, sort of... 72, 80 hours of the session. How quick can you tie those rigs, mate? That's ridiculous. Well, that's another thing with Grenville. You know, I'd learn. It's a bit like match fishing, really, at times. So I, I, I come fishing with six rods. I've got six rods with me now. Right. So when three rods are fishing, I've got three rods leaning against my bivvy. They're, they're ready to cast and ready to go. Um, just for exactly a session like that, you know, I was getting bites that fast Fortunately, I had two friends either side of me. One lad was in peg eight, one lad was in peg five. And without them, I wouldn't have been able to catch the fish that I caught because they were taking, I was landing the fish, they were taking the fish off me. Yeah. They were weighing, yeah. sorting the fish out. I was re-chucking a rod and they were saying, right, it's ready. It's 32 pounds. And I was running to the back of the bivvy, taking a quick picture. Often, while I was taking that picture, do 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 you'd be getting a bite. So without them, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So memorable catches, surely that was... Um, that That's was 65 fish, mate. I'd be in absolute bits, mate. Yeah, well, 65 bites, about 62 fish. So hectic. Killed me. It literally killed me. You know, you try to tie rigs, eat food, wave, all that sort of thing. You know, it was mega. And to be honest, I don't think I'd want to do it again. <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah. I don't think I'd want to do it again. <laughs> yeah. You ain't going to try and better it. No, 66. not at all. But I, but I did better it, actually. No. In, 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 I, I think I bettered that because... Two or three years later, I caught 40 fish, or 42 fish, but that was in 36 hours in a oh different peg. Days. So it was just as hectic. I mean, Paul was sat with me for, for quite a bit of when I was catching them fishing. A couple of times, Paul had to pick a rod up while I was playing another rod. So, yeah, so, you know, 62, 60 odd fish in four days or 40 fish in 40 hours or whatever it was. Um, but God. just an example of, when you get it right on this lake, you know, if if you fish effectively, and and you attack it, and you and you and you recognise the opportunity, and think, right, I'm not going to sleep. I'm going to stay up tonight, and I'm going to keep doing this and see when it stops. Then you can have some outstanding results. It's amazing how like positively you can fish it there. I don't know how many lakes you could go, and I know that you've got form and you've charted it. Go in and put twenty key out, thirty key out to start with, and then be in a position to think i'm going to get bikes within 24 hours maybe even shorter than that that is a phenomenal like thing to say plus also the quality of fish mate those big scaly ones the sparser scaled really chunky ones like the one that i had just then like there's an incredible sort of smattering of different mega carp that all seem just to keep growing mate and they love the bait yeah well the first stock that paul put in you know the the the, the biggest fishing lake at the minute yeah. you know the simos they um you know they're massive now you know but over the years Paul has crossbred them with, with with his scalies and the commons and even them fish now they're coming through you know they're up to f- mid forty up those to scaly ones mate are just scalies epic. linears commons are now forty plus you know so just a testament to to Paul's fishery management yeah the quality of the lake um you know it, it's an incredible lake but you know on the other hand. It's it's so easy to make it sound like it's a runs water, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, I could understand people thinking that, having heard what I've just said. But you know, there's there's times on this lake when the fish disappear. Mate, you've you know, torn apart many of places. You're an incredible angler. It's a, it is not an easy process. You have got 72 acres of water, aren't you? And depths. It's not it's not a gimme. Mate. No, it, it, it's it's not a given. You know, I mean, I, I have blanked on here. You know, it, it's you know, I'm I'm really fortunate. The reason. You know, I do really well and I've had lots of fish. You know, there's a couple of examples. You know, there's no doubt having a bait deal and being able to mm. bring the amount of bait I can bring when, you know, the normal man, the working man, who probably hasn't, you know, has got to pay for his bait, you know, he is at a disadvantage. You know, it's not all about, it's not just about angling ability. You know, I can use free bait. I can use as much of it as I can. Another massive advantage I've got is I can come when I want, you know. Yeah. You know, I'm not working, you know, I don't really need to work at the minute. So I'm in a really fortunate, you know, a lot of people don't know, but I'm not far off 60. 
And um, it's ridiculous that no one's going to believe that, mate. <laughs> exactly, I, you know. <laughs> I even asked the old cameraman, like, how old is he? He's like, you have, you have your forties, late forties, max. You, that's ridiculous. I'm not having it. Yeah, it's got well, some dodgy passport. <laughs> <laughs> the wrong age. Well, on exactly. It. You know, I have got that life behind me where I, I'm in a fortunate position now. You know, financially, that you know, um, I can fish when I want, and you know, with Grenville, especially Grenville. I just let the weather tell me when to go fishing. You know, if I can see, you know, we can get, we can all get weather forecast these days. You know, mm. going up to two weeks in, in into the future, so you can you can plan it. I can see it. You know, there's going to be a wind change then. Going to be a low pressure coming in then. So that basically, the weatherman will tell me when to go fishing. So generally, you know, that's why I do really well because I go on the lows. Granville loves a blow. It loves a wind. It loves low pressures, which is great really because at the minute I've got an arcade ticket, as you know, and. That's like a high, you know, I'm, I'm hearing off the locals, high pressure there. So if it's high pressure and I want to go fishing, I'll go there. I'll just wait for the lows to come in on Grenville and um, I'll fish it when I think it's right. Talk to me about the bigger, mate, the 60 that, that you just had. How um, did that come to be, mate? Because there's like, is there anything with regards to trying to sort out those better fish here? Is there anything you've found? I mean, I'm, I could be giving the game away to, to other people that are fishing the Cindy, but is there anything that you've found that can single them out? Have you tried anything to do that? Or is it just a case of, like you say and you said before, bites and then eventually that big one will come? Yeah, I would probably say if 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 any angler was coming to Grenville and wanting to catch a 60 or, mm. or the bigger fish, I would say don't do it the way I've done it. <laughs> right, <laughs> because, right. Because it's took me so bloody long to get it. It's took me so many bites to to, to catch that big one. Don't get me wrong; I've had a, a good good amount of fifties. Um, How many fifties you had? Do you know? <sighs> I, I, do you know what? A lot of lads can't believe it when they ask me that question, and I say I don't know. I mean, this lake, for instance. Um, as I say, my memory's shocking, and Paul will probably be able to answer that instantly for you. Uh, but I think I've had about. 14 from this lake my life well that's not different ones that might be six or seven different ones um i've had a lot a lot of big fish and it has took me many bites and i've seen a lot of anglers um funnily enough you know the anglers that might turn up at uh, six o'clock on a friday afternoon when most of the areas that you might want to fish have gone right and they end up being you know maybe in a peg that's not fancied or not on the on the bulk of the fish so many times I've seen anglers, them type of anglers, not get many bites, but they get the big ones. And if I wanted to catch, if I went out and out to try and catch the big ones or the, one of the big ones, I would probably not fish on where the bulk of the fish are. You know, I have right. caught a 60 eventually, but I think that just had to happen sooner or later just by the sheer number of bites that that that, that was getting each session. So you didn't do anything different in that session? Didn't do nothing, nothing different. Just fished, you know, usual back of the wind. One thing Grenville has taught me, I've always been a wind angler all mm. my all my life. Wind angler, especially on a big pit, you think, you know, get, yeah. a, get on a fresh wind and that's where they're going to be. And sure enough, you know, on this lake in the warmer months, that is the case. You know, a fresh wind will be on it. Um, but it took me a couple of seasons to of watching anglers, especially when the water started to cool down and get cold. Uh, watching anglers, that you know, the anglers that have fished it for a few years, that, that, that know the fish movements, back of the wind. You know, the amount of times I've been on a cold wind in December, you know, 15 mile an hour wind and, and, and that's a blow on here. You know, branches branches coming down around you. Yeah. Anywhere else you'd think this is it, but no, they're getting caught on the back of the wind. And eventually, you know, I wised up to that. And that, 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 that catch that I was spoke about where I caught 40 odd fish in 36, 40 hours, that was exactly that. You know, is it? I, I seen the forecast, it was quite cool. And it was going to be storm force winds, so it wasn't really possible. The wind was doing exactly the same as it is now. It was a northerly coming right. into this bay. And it wasn't possible to fish on the wind. So I went back of the wind, fished at 40 plus wraps, you know, which is long. But yeah, you got the wind when you've got, you yeah, know, yeah. a 25, 30 mile, mile an hour wind behind you, you can do it. And um, that's where they were. Uh, when you lift into that 60 pound, did you know instantly it's an absolute chunk? Um, not with that fish, no. No? I didn't. No, no. I knew it was good. A bit like your fish that you've just had. You know, you can tell it's you know it's not a small one. But as I said to you when you was playing that, the amount of times I've had a fish on and, you know, before I've seen it, it might have been on for ten for you know, for five, ten minutes, I thought to myself, if I lose this fish now I have uh, surely <laughs> I have lost one of the big ones. Yeah. And then I've got it in the edge and it's popped up and I've landed it and it's you know still a big and it's still a you know, a low to mid thirty. But if I would have lost it I would have been 
50, convinced 60. it was a, it was one of the like you know 50 plus um with that particular fish i knew it was a good one you know i was catching a few fish at the time i knew it was a good one and um it actually went down the margin to the right and i kind of bullied it to be fair you know it was going <laughs> it was going as it was coming in it come from it came through some light some real light reeds not not heavy reeds but because it was coming through these light reeds and as it was coming through, I thought, well, I want to keep this fish moving. I don't really want it to change direction now. It's only a rod length from the rod, from from the net. So I was heavily bent into it. And it was only as it went in the net, I thought, mm, wow, that, um, that looks decent. Fortunately, I had Steve Kerry, who, who you know, yeah. runs DNA. Yeah, yeah. He was in the next peg at the time. So, um, you know, I've, I called him on the phone. He came over and I said to him, you need to look at this. I said, I said that, that that might be the biggest fish I've ever caught out of here. You know, at the time, you know, I've had fish up to 58 and a half out of the lake. So... <laughs> Yeah, lifted it out. Paul came along. Paul recognised, you know, Paul knows all these fish yeah, off by yeah, heart. Yeah. He recognised it. Turn it over. Let me look at that. Oh, yeah. That was last out at 58. And um, sure enough, on the on the scales, it, it, it was 60, 60 pound 12 or something, 60 pound 10. That is an unbelievable fish, mate. A 60 pounder in the UK is unreal. Like, and it's definitely, like, going to do a British record at some point, mate. They seem to just keep growing. Like, is, is, that, a, is that a target for you? Is it something you're bothered about? Not, not, you know, it's not something I'm bothered about at all. No, but I can't deny the fact that as as a lad, I think we'd all, you know, as a lad, you know, we all look at the British record, you know, going back to you know when Chris Yates caught the British record, yeah. and then then that mantle was handed over to Two Tone and yeah. you know Mary. So just for nostalgic reasons, you've got I've got these. You can see them pictures in your head, can't you? Oh, iconic, mate. You know, iconic pictures. Terry yeah. Irm with Mary. You know. You just see them, so just for that, you know, I would, I, I, I would like to catch, but of course I would. I'd like to catch, you know. Uh, but what is the British record these days? No one seems. Do you to reckon know. they'd have it if, if, if you caught? Well, you could have it today, couldn't you, mate? Would you, would you reckon they'd, they'd take it? Do you reckon it would be? Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to say. You know, there's 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 so many opinions of Grenville. Um, you know, you know, in in the carp fishing world, yeah. You know, there's um, you know, Paul does 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 feed the fish you know yeah. you know but but you know the amount of carp that are in here the amount of food he 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 puts in here personally i don't think it, it has got it's got little if any benefit of of the fish weights i think if paul didn't do what he did the fish would still grow massive in Grenville. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know there's no doubt it's the perfect environment but you know if I caught one, I mean, well, what is the British record though? You know, yeah. you, I mean, we had the fish, you know, that a few years. fish should have been had it, the winged fish it? a few years ago. That was eighty three. You know, you know, the bloke didn't, didn't, didn't. Um, yeah, fed. Yeah, didn't sub, didn't submit it for for the claim. But in in my eyes, that is the British record because, yeah. you know, it was a spawn bound fish. People say it was spawn bound. It was poorly. It died shortly after. But you know how many other spawn bound carp have we had that have been you know the top of the list? It took know? a hook, but it got caught, didn't it? Exactly, like, yeah. So in my eyes, that really is the British record. You know, will Granville ever do an eighty plus? I don't think it will. Will it do? You know, a mid sixty, upper sixty? Yeah, I think it possibly will. Seventy? Um, it's possible. I think it's definitely possible. So it's some place, mate. Like yeah. it's ridiculous. It is just like I don't know. I don't know what to to sort of rational it as. It's like. It's like I don't know going to Slovenia, mate, to some crazy bear lake or something, isn't it? Yeah, like it's, it, it's just an incredible gaff. Like, yeah. yeah, mate, you're very lucky to have a ticket. As is anybody who's got yeah. a ticket. I mean, I've got um, a ticket now. I, I, you know, people say to me, "When are you going to drop your ticket? When are you going to move on?" I mean, I am starting to think about moving on. Oh yeah, I, I am starting. Well, that doesn't mean I'm going to drop my ticket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I've got no intention to drop no. my ticket anytime soon. But you know, I've caught a lot of fish. Yeah. And as we as we spoke before, you know, uh, you know, I've recently had a you know an arcade ticket, and you've smashed there on your first session as well. Yeah, mate, I've done it? really well. So I'm I'm starting to enjoy the challenge of, of of elsewhere, and that's why I have found myself down arcade. You know, in the last in the last twelve months. Yeah, and another incredible complex of lakes, mate. But I think like I probably have Yately in yesteryears. You get then get like Collinbrook. You get those venues that become synonymous. And this at this time, right here, right now. If you're coming onto the carp scene as maybe a modern day angler, this is the Yately, isn't it? Purely yeah. because of what is out there, what's been, what Paul's done with the fishery, and what potential it still has. Do you know what I mean? I think like there's no two ways about that. Hence why I want to pin the man down on a podcast, mate, and talk to him. Yeah, about you need it. to do that. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll be bending his ear as well. Well, there's that many rumours and myths, and you know, what people's opinions on 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 Grenville. Paul really does need to do. 
you know, to do a podcast, okay. set the record straight, you know. You know We're you know, okay. I man. get it all the time, you know, they've been stocked in there at £50 and, yeah. you know, and all the rest of it. So Yeah, yeah. of course, rumours. But for you, you talked about your, your arcade ticket, Kingsmead. It started mega, mate. What did you have? You had a ridiculous hit. Well, it's my second year. You know, um, I got a ticket last year. I only fished it three or four yeah, times. you didn't really fish it last year, did you? I fished it a couple of times. Um, again, fortunate straight away. You know, I caught one of the big ones, you know, a fish called Boris, for mid-40. Um, brilliant. Um, so that sort of introduced me to, to, to the to the complex, the Horton complex. Was that your it. first bite on there? Um, I think it was the first bite. That <laughs> yeah. just mad. I think it was the first bite, yeah. Again, on my rig, you know, who knows whether it was that or not, or just written in the stars. But yeah, my first bite, first season. So I caught a few fish, and then um, obviously new season now. Um, been back, you know, I've been dying to get back. You know, it's completely, as I've said, completely different style of fishing to Grenville. Yeah. You know, you've got to be on your toes on there. You know, it's busy. There's buckets in swims. Um, everyone's getting about, and you know, there's a lot of lads trying. You know, love it. I love that. I love that style. Yeah, so, you can see it. You know, um, you know, recently I've been on there. You know, had a result. You know. The biggest fish in the lake, you know, caught 18 carp. Um, uh, the scar 50, 54, something backed up by the football, Sutton 46 summit. Yeah, football Sutton as well. Yeah, yeah I remember plus, that. plus other fish. Um, again, you know, they were there to be caught. I'm sure whoever was in that peg, ah, oh, mate, don't be modest about this. No, I'm sure no. whoever was in that peg, um, at that time would have caught fish. They might not have caught many, no. they might have caught more. I don't know, but the fish, was, I mean, there was a lad that went in after me, and you know, he did really well. He caught he caught a good number of fish, so they were there. You know, the lads have said to Probably me, Probably Reedy trying to follow you in, mate. Reedy was on the opposite side, actually. <laughs> um, he didn't do too bad himself. No, he caught a few, you. mate. He caught a nice one, yeah, yeah, yeah. He did. I he think, did. like, you're very modest, mate. Like, you look at your record across multiple different eras. Multiple different venues, multiple different styles of angling, and one thing has been consistent, mate. You've smashed it. Yes, you've had time. Yes, you've managed to create a lifestyle which facilitated your angling. Like, don't get me wrong, there's no two ways about that, but you've made that happen. You've mm. done it, you've been out there, and there's a, a few fish, maybe, the odd fish here and there, the twin or whatever that might be a lady that might have evaded you. But in terms of consistency of catching across all that time and across all those different venues mate there's, you mm. can't take that away from you mate that's not luck yeah you know there's no doubt you know time and accessibility to the waters is is is, is a massive is a massive factor you know you, you've worked for them though mate you know, because you? yeah I know, I know what you're saying but you know I, I am in a fortunate position you know you know I've, I've sort of sculpted my life you know obviously involved in the Northern Angling show for many years you know that was was, was paying yeah. me a good wage for a long time um, you know, again, so once a year event that needed to be organised, Reedy was part of that, as you know, helped us a great deal. So, oh, don't tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I've, I, I've been lucky, but having said that, you know, you can structure your life. It depends on what you want out of life. You know, some guys fishing, you know, fishing is not that important to him. Yeah. You know, they've got families and all the rest of it. So, yeah. You know, I don't think, you know, I would never say. And one thing, you know, a lot of anglers, I was asked the question, I was asked the question a couple of years back as, um, you know, how do you feel, you know, yourself, how do you rate yourself sort of thing? And it's really weird because I have never, even now when I go on a new water, I've got so many doubts, you know, I'm I'm, I'm, yeah? I'm, I'm so, I, I doubt, I doubt it all the time, you know, am I going to catch, you know, can I do it? It's really weird. It's strange because, like you say, there's no doubt that, you know, I have caught, I've done well on quite a few waters over the years. But I still don't, I still don't think I'm good. It's weird. It just, no, just, just can't get yeah, my head around mate. it. It's, Maybe that's what keeps you driven and keeps things pushing yeah. on as well. It's just, I think as soon as you start blowing your own trumpet, as soon as you yeah. think, you know, this is going to be, you know, a walk in the park, you know, I'm going to do it. As soon as you start thinking like that and you stop trying, as soon as you stop trying, then your results drop down, you know. Mate, I very much look forward to seeing what you uh, you do on here and also on uh, on the old RK complex in the future, mate. And thank you so much, not only for inviting me down here and letting me get the rods out, courtesy of Paul as well, but also <laughs> for taking the time to do this, mate. Yeah, no worries, mate. I was a little bit nervous about doing it, um, but <sighs> yeah. You've been mega. Um, before you go, I've got some quick fire questions for you, mate. Okay, nice okay. and relaxed, nice and chilled. Um... What would you take, a UK new PB or a foreign world record, mate? UK new PB. Ooh, you done much abroad? I've done a bit um, and caught quite a lot. Um, 
anyway with Jamie, yeah. Sayaki, you know, fished all the waters, um, enjoyed every minute of it. But there's something about when you once you come back over that channel and come back to this country, I don't even think about them fish anymore. Don't count. I won't say they don't count. And it's each to their own, you know. If he's sitting on the fence now, he's saying he don't count. It's better in the UK. That's yeah, fine, yeah. Man. Personally, for me, yeah, I would rather spend a week on my syndicate than a week in France. Fair dues. Uh, drum and bass or country and western? Drum and bass all day long. Mm, oh dear. Uh, three celebrities you'd take fishing. They can be past or present, mate. Mm. Celebrities I would take fishing. Oh, um, probably Bob Marley. Oh, hey, Sit down, Bob. Mate. Get Chill the guitar out. out, Bob. Watch the sun. Watch the sun go down. Um, all the celebrities. God, um, God, you're taking God. Uh, no, not God. Not <laughs> Came God. down. I don't know. I couldn't say anybody else. I have no <laughs> idea. I mean, celebrity anglers. I'd love to fish with a few celebrity anglers. You know, obviously, you did the likes of Hutchinson. Um, yeah, Rod Wooden. You know, Richie McDonald. All the blokes that you know, the famous five. Yeah. Um, um, Rob Mailing, all them guys that, as I was, as a lad, I wanted to, I wanted to be them basically. Love it, love it. Uh, one angler you choose to catch a carp to save your life, who would that be? Right here, right now. If I had to pick an angler, one to catch a carp to save my life. Yeah. You not, you might not even know this name. Go on. There's a little bloke on here that well, used to be on here, and he's been. He's left here now, and everywhere he goes, he catches fish. John Eggleston. Does he's it? called Iggy. He had the um, he had the Mary's leather twice, quite quickly. Everywhere he goes, he, 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 he catches him, and he's very low key. He's a mover. He's a watcher. He's small amounts of bait. He's an exceptional angler. You got so, his number. Let's get him on the next pod. <laughs> Iggy, we're after you, Iggy, mate. Yeah. Um, fish you wish you'd caught. Oh, that's easy. Um, probably the fat lady. Mm, fair dues. What's your idea of carp fishing hell? Carp fishing hell? Yeah. Linear fisheries. <laughs> uh, best piece of advice you've ever been given? Um, I can't quite remember um, any sort of advice that I was out and out given, but I would probably say, you know, don't don't believe if anybody says, you know, you can't catch them on pop ups, you can't catch them on, you know, don't go there and do what everybody else is doing. You know, go there with an open mind. Any water, go there with an open mind and figure it out yourself. You know, because once you figure something out yourself, you know, the amount of water I've been in, been to in the past where, you know, you don't catch them up that end, you don't catch them on a certain type of bait. Stick to an open mind. Use your skills, use your watercraft, put yourself on fish, and, and I think you'll you'll be all right. Final question, mate. Night out on the bank or a night in with the missus? Um, probably a night out on the bank. Fair play. <laughs> Still <Sport laughs> bacon. You've been an absolute star, mate. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you guys for watching and listening. I'll be back soon with another Nash Off the Hook podcast. Until then, Paul, thank you so much, mate. Pleasure.